Welcome to Be With Champions. I'm your host, Greg Bennett. And today I have a wonderful chat with an incredible athlete and an even better man, Hunter Kemper. Hunter describes his process to reach the top of the world and sustain it for 20 years. We share some of our career highlights and and a few of our, our horror stories. I love that Hunter from the young age of 10 went all in to be the best triathlete that he could be. And at times throughout his career, that was the best in the world. So many colorful stories with fantastic takeaways in this one, just for our own lives. Just a really fun chat. Now, a quick few bits of housework before we get going. Um, Please go to bennettendurance.com forward slash media for the show notes, the timestamps, links, and the sponsor coupon codes. Uh, Please share and subscribe. Uh, You'll be doing me a huge favor with that. And finally, Please keep that feedback coming, uh, whether on social media, my Instagram, Greg Bennett, Greg Bennett World, excuse me, or uh, Greg Bennett One on Twitter. That would be fantastic. I'm also Greg Bennett on Facebook. Um, and if you want to do any reviews on iTunes, I also read those and appreciate those. I just won't be able to get back to you. Thanks for listening. Enjoy this one. Before we start, I've got to give a quick shout out to the brands that make this show possible. The only brands I'm working with are brands that provide products that I use daily and truly believe in. These products support my immunity, they help improve my recovery and my focus. First up, my friends at Athletic Greens. I love this company and I love their all-in-one daily drink. It's become a part of my morning routine. I'm heavily focused on supporting my immunity and boosting my energy and, and helping my gut health, but I want to do it naturally. And I found that support with Athletic Greens a whole food sourced green drink that tastes great and there's no hassle. It's delivered straight to your door. And it's a highly absorbable powder that takes seconds to mix with water so there's no clumpiness to deal with. I can't believe a green drink sourced from whole foods can actually taste so good. Personally, I truly love it. It's developed from a complex blend of 75 vitamins and minerals. It's packed with aptogens for recovery, probiotics and digestive enzymes for gut health, and vitamin C and zinc citrate for immune support. So Athletic Greens is designed to help fill the nutritional gaps in your diet. And there's a great offer going on now for you to give it a try. Simply go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg to claim our special offer of 20 free daily travel packets with your first order. $79 added value. And get Athletic Greens delivered straight to your door. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. This show is also brought to you by my friends at Hyperice. Some of these products I've been using for almost a decade. Makers of the award-winning Hypervolt, the world's most powerful percussion massage device featuring quiet glide technology. Hyperice is a wellness tech company that makes devices designed to help you move better. From handheld massage devices to vibrating foam rollers, thermal technology, and the Normatec compression systems, Hyperice helps you warm up faster, recover quicker, and simply move better. Used in professional training rooms throughout the NBA, the NFL, MLB, the MLS, Ironman, and other professional organizations for well over a decade. Designed to help improve circulation, flexibility, and relieve tension. Get $50 off all percussion devices now. No code needed. And get an additional 10% off with code GREG10 at hyperice.com. That's hyperice.com. H-Y-P-E-R-I-C-E. Dot com and use code GREG10 for 10% off. All right, today's guest is the most decorated U.S. triathlete in history, a four-time member of the U.S. Olympic triathlon team. He's one of only two men in the world to compete in the first four Olympic triathlons in 2000, 2004, 2008, and 2012. A seven-time U.S. elite national champion. He also won the ITU World Cup Series in 2005. And he's won all the big money events in the U.S., including Minneapolis in 2006 and the High V Triathlon in 2012. Over the years, he's been a national spokesperson for the various youth triathlon events, as well as several children's foundations. A father of five, he's passionate about promoting health and wellness to the country's youth. He's one of the best men you could ever meet. And he's been a fierce competitor, a peer, and just a good friend of mine for well over 20 years. So welcome Thanks for joining me on Be With Champions, Hunter Kemper. How are you, mate? Oh, I'm doing well, Greg. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here today. Of course, mate. Where, where are you chatting to me from? I'm actually uh, coming from Michigan. I'm on vacation with the uh, with the family in Grand Rapids, Western Michigan. So my in-laws, hanging out with them for a little, little uh, sunshine on uh, uh, by the lakes. 
Very good, mate, because otherwise you're in Colorado Springs. Is that where you still are since you retired? I am. Yes, I'm down in the Springs. Yep, down in Colorado yeah. Springs, uh, just an hour south of Denver, an hour and a half south of Boulder, yeah. which many yeah. triathletes know very well, you you included. And <laughs> um, the Springs is a good place. Uh, it's home. It's Olympic City, USA. It's, it's home to the uh, Olympic Training Center and now to the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Museum and Hall of Fame. Actually, I just saw that you put that out on uh, Twitter. Was it last week? They just opened up the museum. What's been your involvement with that? I've, I've been on the board, uh, board of directors for uh, three years. Um, they have to have some athlete representation, so I fill that quota. And uh, I'm one of uh, <laughs> t- three athletes on there. Um, Joey Cheek, a uh, long track speed skater, uh, gold medalist. And then also Benita Fitzgerald Mosley, uh, 1984 uh, medalist in, in, in hurdles. So um, we, I'm, I'm one of the athletes. I've been on there three years. It's an amazing project. We've never had a place where Olympians and Paralympians from the United States can call home, a yeah. place uh, that they can see uh, their stories on the walls and their victories and their celebrations there. And so it's, it was an amazing project. It's just not ideal, probably, as you know, to open in a pandemic. It's not, mm. it's not something that you probably want to do, but we are open. So if you're in the, uh, on the front range in Colorado or anywhere near Come on down to Colorado Springs and, and take a look. It's about a 90-minute walkthrough, and uh, you can be inspired. I mean, that's the goal, right, to, to mm-hmm. basically set the hopes and dreams of the next generation and, and get them excited about, about sport in general. So, so what have you have you got some memorability in there, or what do people see when they go through the the museum? They see uh, thirty eight. They will see thirty eight torches in this torch display in Gallery Two Three, kind of right when you come in. To you go to the lobby, you see this amazing sail, forty foot tall sail that has um, these amazing images of the of the best Olympians in the world that have uh, represented the United States. Then you go up to the third floor and you kind of do like a, a walk through, uh, 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 all winding down to the uh, first floor. Our goal in the museum was to make it the most accessible museum in the world, right, in terms of accessibility so that anyone in a wheelchair, anyone that's blind, anyone that um, um, struggles with cognitive, uh, you know, disability, um, they can have the same shared experience that we as able-bodied athletes can as well. So the Paralympian movement is intertwined throughout the Olympic movement. Very, very well done. So that was our goal. Accessibility was number one. I think we... We reached that. And then also um, in regards to RFID technology. So um, it's a type of technology that when you come through it, it identifies you and your favorite things, like your favorite sports in the Olympic Games, you can kind of pre-program that in and kind of have a unique experience to you. So it's a, it's a cool experience, but you'll get to see torches, all, all the torches from the 1936 Games in Berlin when the torch relay first started back in Berlin, all the way to the 2020 torch or 2021 torch in Tokyo. We had some kids go over to Tokyo and, and be a part of that relay and, and they've, uh, they had the torch brought home. So it was, uh, it's cool. I mean, you get to see that, you get to see the entire medal collection from the 1896 modern games all the way to the 2018, uh, uh, Pyeongchang games in, in, in Korea. So it's just, uh, there's an inter- athlete interactive. You and I can race 30 meters on a, on a Mondo surface track and get oh, our really? result. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we need to get ourselves back out there racing each other. <laughs> yes, we do. We absolutely do. So it's a fun, it's a fun, uh, it's a fun building. It's again, a 90 minute walk through and it's, uh, it's something that has been long overdue and it's been a fun project to be a part of. Oh, so thanks for, nice. yeah. Thanks for letting me share about it. Of course, mate. I was, uh, was my next question was going to be, you know, I think we spoke probably a, a year and a half ago, two years. I think you just retired, um, you know, after a, a twenty years at least uh, of being a, a professional athlete on top of the world, or at least on top of uh, the U.S. for the longest, you know, time. How's that transition been for you? I mean, you've obviously had this project. Uh, what other things have you been doing since retirement? And 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 how has that re- transition been? I've talked about that a bit on the show with a number of athletes, including, you know, Simon Thompson, who I went to the Olympics with in 04, and a number of other athletes have sort of talked about their experiences of transition. What's that been like for you? Yeah, you know, it's a great question, Greg. Um, for me, the transition has not been um, easy. Honestly, it's been a it's been a work in progress for me. You know, when you do something you love and you found out what you wanted to do and be at an early age. I mean, I, I started doing triathlons at the age of ten, and so to have a twenty year professional career from nineteen ninety eight all the way to twenty eighteen when I officially retired, mm-hmm. um, it, the, the past few years has been it's been a struggle. I'm not going to lie because I I just I just love what I did, and I know you can say the same thing. I mean, we wouldn't have had the careers that we had. We wouldn't have had the longevity in, in the sport without amazing sponsors, without great support with our family and our team around us, right? Our coaches and our support team. 
but um, but also with that passion and that love. And I still feel like I haven't found that in that next transition. I've enjoyed working on this museum project. I'm doing some consulting with them as well. You know, I'm also doing some stuff with USA Triathlon with kids events. My heart is in that youth and junior racing, right? That elite level racing. Um, it's where my passion, where my heart is. So it's um, but it, but it has not been easy. And I've I've had fun working on. There's a project that USA Triathlon has done. Rocky Harris, a, a program called T3, uh, Transition Three T3 that they just launched, and it's for elite athletes to start thinking about life after sport, after professional sport, while they're still in, right? Mm. And I I didn't really do that very well. I was kind of an all in kind of guy, so I didn't really think about what life was like afterwards until afterwards, you know, until my retirement, <laughs> which might not have been the best thing, honestly, to, to make this transition very, very, to make it very smooth. But T3 and Rocky Harris has put together a program with USA Triathlon that has mentorship involved, internships, you know, education, furthering their education, uh, talk space, and there's a mental health comp- a component as well. So if athletes kind of kind of start learning about themselves after sport and kind of what they could be good at, I think it'd be very beneficial. It'd be a program that I could use. So I've, I've kind of had fun doing that. But, you know, honestly, it's been, it's been a bit of a struggle. Like, I mean, what, for me, when I used to race, I had sponsors and I would, you know, we'd, you know, we'd, we'd win money at, at races and I, I could take and support my family. And now I'm thinking about, wow, I've got five kids. Like, this is going to be a bit of a challenge mm. to actually fund the, uh, the grocery bill. I mean, you get it now. You've got mm. two of your own. Yeah, welcome no. to the hey, welcome to the club, by the way. <laughs> you know? It's a different club. Five <laughs> to two, mate. I think it's a different club altogether. But I understand everything you're saying. You know, it's uh you and I are very similar, and, and I think even my wife Laura, uh, we were kind of very much all in type people. It's funny, you know, I had Alistair Brownlee on on the show. And yes. and Alistair Brownlee is one of these guys that just blows you away. Like, right. Okay. So for people that don't know, he won the 2012 Olympic triathlon on home soil in London under all the pressure coming in as the favorite. He's still pressure. Yeah. Yeah. And he still, he stood up and just delivered the most magnificent performance. Then he backs it up again in, in Rio four years later, wins another gold medal. We chatted about on this show, I said to him, you know, and he started describing how he did his master's degree in, I think it was finance. Excuse me if I'm getting this wrong, but I think it was finance. And he was talking about the timeline and everything. I said, hang on, weren't you getting ready for the London Olympics? He goes, yeah. oh, yeah, I found it as a nice little break from training. This guy was doing a master's degree in finance while he wow. was getting for the biggest pressure. Right? So wow. whereas my mind when I was doing triathlon, it was a little bit more like I was kind of more insular and the blinders were on and, and I was yes. heavily focused like you were on. Yes. And like you touched on is – we were very fortunate to find a passion and live that passion. We, mm-hmm. And that's part of what this show is about is understanding when, when did you, uh, you know, identify that passion and when did you align it with strengths? You know, it's one thing to be passionate. It's another, you got to have the strengths to match it. And then you have yeah. to be able to go all in and pull the trigger and really go for it. And you and I were able to do that. And, and I think we were incredibly fortunate for that. I think what happens when you transition away from that is kind of trying to identify, well, what else am I? passionate about what else where else am i talented in on my strengths and and i think for many that's kind of like it's a growth process you know and it's it's maybe not following and i think we had this conversation maybe a year or two ago i don't know that we're going to find our passion immediately but you got to keep just moving and keep putting yourself out there and, and seeing what you can find and, and i can hear the way you you talk about this museum i can hear you talk about yes. the way a t3 and I said to you, I think a while back when I was looking at doing like a high performance role within either USA or, or whatever, I said, oh, Hunter, you'd be the first guy I'd want on my team if I was to build a team because I'd want you to look after everything under 23 down, you know, yeah. developing the kids. I don't think there'd be a better person in the world because it, your passion and seeing you work with all the different foundations that you've done over the years with all the – you you have a, a real desire to help the youth and, and help them find sports and health and wellness. And I think that's where you're going to go. And I just feel like yep. it just hasn't opened up to you maybe as clearly yet. And maybe it's, I don't know, maybe you're just going to have to start it yourself and go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's, that's so true. Like I, I love, I love the youth side. I love the kids side. You know, like I said, I got started in triathlon at the age of 10 doing iron kids back in 86. I did my very first race in Claremont, uh, Florida, which many of think people listening now would, would know well. And it was, it was, it was a Fred summer series event. And, and, uh, I did it with some buddies of mine and it was, uh, you know, a hundred yard swim. That wasn't really a swim it was kind of a waddle through Lake Mineola, which I was by 
bothered by that as a swimmer coming from swimming, because I started swimming at the age of six, that, uh, that it was only 100 yards. And then I biked 5K and, run, and ran uh, one kilometer or a half mile approximately. And, and so for me, it took me 17 minutes to do. I won the race. I beat two other kids that were 10-year-olds at the time. We were all, the whole entire age group was on the podium. You know, it was one of those where, you know, but you're 10 years old and you don't know, right? You just think that, wow, that was awesome. I just had a lot of fun. And I went on to the Iron Kids National Championships. It was the second year doing it. And I won my age group. I beat nine other kids, you know, in Tampa, Florida at Bush Gardens. And it was, uh, it was an amazing experience. And I kept on doing Iron Kids and kept on growing up in the sport and, and winning national titles and was a five-time kid national champion, Iron Kids national champion. And just, you know, I realized that it was something that I was good at, right? I, I wasn't good at the traditional sports. Of, of I played tennis. I did basketball. I did baseball. And I kept on moving down the bench in basketball and down the lineup in baseball. And I, but whereas with triathlon, I kept on, you know, going the heading the right direction. And I went on to college. I, I went to university, Wake Forest University in North Carolina. And I applied to school there and my running times really weren't that good. And I got the media guide back uh, from Wake Forest University and my dad got the mail and he came out. To, I came home from school and he's like, oh, you got some mail. My dad's kind of a real prankster and he thinks it's really he was got a big smile on his face. And I'm like, what is going on here? And he's like, oh, you got some mail. You got to take a look at it. And Wake Forest sent me the women's media guide. They thought Hunter, <laughs> they thought Hunter was a female. And I was like, Rudder. I was like, oh, no, my dad hands me the phone. He's like, hey, man, you got to make a phone call to the men's track program and let them know that you're a guy. And I was like, oh, this is not going to go well. So I called him up and said, hey, listen, I know my times apparently don't signify what 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 sex I am, but I'm, <laughs> I'm a male I'm a male runner, and uh, I guess can, I'm not going to be getting scholarship at your university. And they're like, "Oh, yep, that's right, no scholarship for you." I go, "Can I walk on?" They're like, "Yeah, you can walk on." So I did, but the main reason why I chose running, I was burnt. I mean, one, there's as you may know, and many people might know, there's not triathlon for men in NCAA and 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 collegiate athletics. There is no triathlon on a on a uh, on a championship sport level. There is club, but not on a championship sport. So I wanted to go and make me myself, turn myself from a girl runner into a boy runner and actually like, start running legit times so that I could come out and be a professional triathlete. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be, the guys I looked up to were the Mike Pigs, were the Molinas, right? Were the Greg Welches. I mean, I looked up to all those guys that were the out with our out there doing it, almost like the Bud Light series guys. I mean, yeah. I watched Iron Man a little bit, but I didn't look at Iron Man and think to myself, ooh, that's going to be me and Kona someday. I, I, I thought to myself, the series, the Bud Light. I, I knew that they had sponsors on their jersey. And I'm like, man, that could be me. I can I I know I can do that. And while I was in school, I, I won the amateur national championships. Uh, it was in Maryland, Columbia, Maryland. It was our age group, age group national champs in 1997, uh, my end of my junior year. And before that, they announced that triathlon would be in the Olympic Games in Sydney. And then when I was in school, I realized, you know what? This is perfect. I'm going to graduate in 1998. I'll have two years to fully focus on triathlon and try to make that first uh, Olympic Games team. And it was, it was an amazing ride. From then on, I moved out to Colorado Springs uh, at the Olympic Training Center. Had free housing and free food. It's what brought me out. You know, I wasn't making a whole, <laughs> I wasn't making a whole lot of money, but I knew that I, I very understood the concept of uh, supply and demand and revenue and expenses. And if I could cut my expenses way down, that I could actually live on not a whole lot. And I signed a Polo Ralph Lauren deal. I don't know if you remember back in the day, RLX came out and it was myself and Tim DeBoom, Siri Lindley and Melissa Spooner were one of the first athletes on that RLX team. And it was just a cool thing to be a part of something like that and, and, and a new team, a new project. And, uh, and I was able to make the first Olympic Games in Sydney and, and it just took off from there. So it's like you said, I was able at an early age to figure out what I knew I was good at. I knew I had talent in it and I knew I was going to work hard. I knew what it took that I, I could push myself to the limit. Um, and I, I didn't have, a, I mean, I had a big engine, but not probably bigger than most, but I knew that my passion and my dedication to working hard uh, and enjoying the process every day would get me through. And, and it got me to a, to a very long career. Well, I think uh, you touched on something there. I mean, a couple of things before I move on, uh, just for people that don't understand what a walk-on means in terms of Australians and Europeans. Uh, yes. Walk-on yes. means, Laura did the same for swimming at uh, SMU in, SMU, in, in, yeah. in, in um, Texas. Basically, it means you can go to that school and, and you get to do the sport yep. without a scholarship. But if your times improve enough, then they'll give you a full academic scholarship and they'll pay your fees, correct? That's, 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 a, that's yeah. exactly right. And there's yeah. a funny story there. I was a junior and I become like their third best cross country runner as a junior. And I'm going into my senior year and I go to the coach and I'm like, hey, coach, like I'm one of our main guys. Like this is the time I'm going to get some money, right? Can you give me some money? 
And he sits me down and it's like, hey, buddy, I just want to let you know that we have a lot of freshmen coming in. We only have a certain amount of scholarships. I kind of could, I, I kind of know that you've been able to afford to pay the whole time. So we really can't give you maybe a partial or whatever that you probably deserve. Unlike football, right? Where, you know, wow. like when we watch football and we watch bigger sports, sometimes they, they kind of earn those scholarships and, and cross country, it can be a much more challenging environment. And I probably wasn't delivering maybe as high as I thought I was, but, um, but anyways, I didn't ever, never got that scholarship, but I definitely deserved one. I mean, I would have definitely deserved a, a, a quarter crazy. or a half. Or they, they knew that. you could, they knew you could pay, so they didn't give it to you. That's, it was one, it was one of those. Yeah, it was one of those, but I enjoyed my time at Lake Forest. I mean, they were, they were, yeah, they were great to me. I mean, you know, and they invited me back so good that I, I, I was inducted to the hall of fame in 2009 and I was like, uh-huh. With Tim Duncan, which is one of our famous uh, graduates, uh, uh, he's a five-time world champion in basketball. Played for the Spurs, probably one of the greatest power forwards of all time. And he was he was a year ahead of me. And they came to me on the induction ceremony, like the, cl- the Hall of Fame class, said, "Hey, we want to invite you into the Hall of Fame, you know." But we're also thinking about Tim Duncan as well. But he's not he's not quite certain he's going to be a part of it because he's got some conflicts of interest potentially on the scheduling. And I was like, "Well, here's the deal: if he defers and goes like to 2010, I'm going to call you back and I want to defer as well because I want to go in with that guy. Like that's the, <laughs> Hall, of, that's the Hall of Fame class that I want to be a part of, you know." <laughs> and that happened. What happened it, then? Did no, you no. turn up? He did. He turned up and I turned up. And my entire Hall of Fame speech was about how Tim and I were like best friends, which we really weren't. And like we would play video games together, but I would just watch him play and he would, you know, be in, in the parties <laughs> playing the video games. So it was good. It was good. It was it was a fun time. I, I I loved it. But I love the fact that Wake Forest recognized my career post. It was I didn't get a I didn't get a Hall of Fame at Wake Forest because of what I did at, at Wake Forest. I was an all conference runner, yeah. all ACC. I mean, that's that's okay, but I mean, I was a thirty. I was a thirty sixteen guy in the ten k, and I was a fourteen twenty two guy in the five k. I mean, that's not. That's not. I mean, that's okay, but that's not going to get you. I mean, guys are running twenty eight minutes. You know, to a low to a low twenty eight. You know, for for ten k easily. So, I know, but but don't you look now after retirement, look back at those times and go, wow, <laughs> that's amazing. And ninety nine percent of the listeners out there, I know you're listening, going, hang on. A thirty minute sixteen or a twenty a fourteen twenty two for five k. I'll, I'll take that. I mean, they're incredible times, but I get what you mean in in terms of all American tra- status. All Amer- yeah, yeah, cross yeah. country and track. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're good for the listeners, and they're good for me now. So it's come full circle. It's like yeah, yeah. Said, I would take a fourteen twenty two. I went for a run today, and I'm like, man. I have totally lost it. I, I think I'd take a 2022 20, right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've been spending my time in in the gym. I always promised myself when I retired from sport, you know, I felt like I was always trying to be as you know lean as I possibly could, and and um, and I decided when I retire, my you know my brother was a professional rugby player and built strong, and and my yeah. younger brother is as well, and and so it's in the genes, I think. This whole yeah. So I've I've kind of these last few years hit the hit the gym a, a little bit. Um, and, nice. and definitely about, I think I'm about 12 or 13 kilos heavier. So it's about 25 pounds heavier. I'd like to say it's all muscle. I don't yeah. know if that, <laughs> I think that's the case, but it's been fun transitioning the body into, into something a little bit different. That's been one of the things I've enjoyed post being a professional triathlete was, you know, I still run, I still bike and I still swim a little bit, but I've enjoyed going to the gym and just doing pull-ups and chin-ups and lifting. Oh, the and nice. And stuff. It's kind yeah. of like the Ryan Hall. Have you seen Ryan Hall? It's the same thing. I mean, <laughs> some of his posts, you're like, whoa, dude, you are jacked. You know? <laughs> he's like, he's- I, I, I was going to mention, for people that don't know, Ryan Hall was a U.S. Olympic marathoner. Um, one. He did go to the Olympics, right? Once he or did. twice. Yep. Um, yep. Fan- fantastic. Two oh seven or two oh eight marathon. I don't yes. know what his best time is, but but he's transitioned. I think, I think, he, went, I think he, did, he did Boston the year that they, you know, like it was like kind of like downhill or wind dated. He's gone like two oh four. Yeah. Oh Crazy my goodness. Yeah. 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 But it's it's funny, you know. I, I do think of him often when I'm in the gym because I'm there's that athlete mentality that you bring to whatever you do, whether yes. that be work or now I'm in the gym and it's like, okay, what can I do better? How can I get stronger? How can I be more powerful? You know. What can I do? And I'm like, whoa, calm down. I have to keep reversing myself back out. And these days with two kids, you don't, you'd appreciate this, is look, I have 45 minutes to yep. get to the gym, do a workout and get home. That's, That's right. it. That's and right. so these workouts are becoming – and now if I run on – if I go for a run, generally it's a, 
a VO2 max type workout where I, I, I go to the treadmill, I, I launch it up because I don't want the impact and I basically do 40 seconds on, 20 seconds off and I'll do 20 of those and then go home. And it's just boom, 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 in and out, get the heart rate up, leave. That's a, <laughs> that, well, that's a, good, it's a good thing for everyone. I mean, we should all yeah. be very efficient like that because we all are busy, yeah. right? And yeah. people don't have time. So it's either, yeah, it's either that or you got to get up before the kids even get up. Yeah, exactly. So early, early in the morning. I also love about your story, the the Colorado Springs, because doing some homework for this show, I saw that one of the things that, I don't know if it's a career highlight, but it's a highlight of you, is that you're the longest resident, is that what you'd say, at the at the Colorado Springs, the Olympic Training Center? Um, I don't know if that meant you resided or you just have been it, there the longest or how absolutely. that worked. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it is. It's something I'm, I'm pretty proud of. I mean, I mean, it's just, it's on complex. So I, I was there on complex, uh, for five years, 98 to 03. And, um, and then I moved off complex in 2003 and then was a resident all the way until, uh, through 2016 to the 2016 game. So that's 18 years that I was considered to be an on complex or off complex resident. It was pretty cool. But the cool thing about Colorado Springs and the best thing about it was, is that I met my wife there. So it's like yeah. one stop shop, you know, it's like one stop shopping, <laughs> you know, you get, you get everything, you get your training, you get your fitness, fitness, you get your sports psychology and you get your spouse. <laughs> you find it all right there in the dining hall. It's all right there, all with the nutrition all around you. So yeah, I met Val. She was a indoor volleyball player. Um, Valerie Sterk was her maiden name and she was playing at the national team, um, going for the Sydney games in 2000 uh, Olympics for indoor volleyball. And she got cut in June 10th of 2000, the morning she got cut, that evening we went out on our very first date. It was like this whole situation was kind of, you know, I just felt like I was a good person for her, like a shoulder for her to cry on, just kind of lean on. <laughs> and uh, I just try to tell as many jokes, not about volleyball, but just about just being funny in my own way, because she was going through a really difficult time. And I think what it shows you is we did a sport, you and I, and all many of these listeners do a sport that's individual, right? It's an individual sport sport because you can, so you can kind of, whatever you kind of put in is kind of what you get out. Yeah. But a lot of times in team sports, it, it's, it's not, I mean, you can put in all the work and dedication. She devoted it herself. She was out there in 97, all the way 2000, three years, she committed herself and, and was certain she was a part of this Olympic team. And then, you know, a couple of girls come in at the last minute that she doesn't make the final trip. And then she gets cut off the team and a coach says, I like this middle blocker style of play better than I like yours. Therefore, you're not going to make this final trip and you're not going to go to Sydney. And it was a tough, I think it was tough for her to handle, you know, but she still got to go. We had just started dating and she was in Sydney. She got, got to watch me compete. And I think it was hard, really hard for her. But I think it was just fun for her to be kind of supporting me and, and in my dream, my passion. And as an alternate for volleyball, it's not like you get to go on the trip and be a part of the whole thing. It's kind of like you're a phone call away that if a knee goes or a shoulder goes on one of the girls, then maybe we'll ring you up. But it's not like you get to be kind of part of the whole ride. So, um, but yeah, but it was one stop shopping at the Olympic Training Center. I mean, I met my spouse and five kids later and she's been <laughs> my, my number one support crew by far. Uh I love that. I love, I love, I mean, a lot of what this show is about is, is not only the, the athlete's journey, like you said, we're, for, for majority of the people I speak to are individual athletes and um, you tend to do the journey, but what I've been fascinated by is the team and the relationships that each of us have had to build to surround ourselves. Um, you know, and like you said, Val has just been your rock, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that stability in your home life is what's allowed you to grow over your career. Because one of the things I've found with you, and I don't, how do I put this so it sounds respectful, but I, I think in 2000, you were a good athlete. Yes. But I didn't look at you as like, oh my God, Hunter Kemper. I was like, nope. okay, there's a young American kid that's coming through, a kid, I should yep. say. That. You, you were 26 yeah. or whatever. But, 24, but, yeah. But, but, then, but then it was um, 04, suddenly here you were, and, and um, I think you finished 10th with, I think you beat me in the run split by about two seconds. Yeah, um, we, but, we were right there, yes. Yeah, um, and then sort of by 08, here you were mixing it up. And, and what was special about the 08 Olympics, I thought, was, you know, we had Javier Gomez. It was the first time we saw Alistair Brownlee, uh, Bevan Doherty, Jan Fredino bursting on the scene. And you finished seventh, but you're right there. And more importantly, between that 04 and 08 period was, you know, you won the World Cup Series in 2005. Yeah. Um, you, I think you won your first World Cup in Madrid. Yeah, that 2003. Year? Yeah, it was That earlier. was 2003. Was I'm yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. That's good. But, yeah. But, yeah. but I, yeah. I, lo I love this progression. And then by 
as the years went on, you and I, I think when I did my retirement note, it was funny. And I think when you did your retirement, I kind of went through and went, wow, we raced each other a lot because you and I were racing in those early days, definitely on the World Cup circuit. When I say early days, it was probably late days for me, but your earlier days. And then we raced so much in the in, in the US here and all the non-drafting races in, in the uh, Lifetime Fitness Series, the Toyota Cups and, and the High Vs and all these other races. So I was like, wow, Hunter's been a real menace of mine for a long, long time. And, and I think if we counted our wins versus each other, it's pretty even, Stephen, by the end of it all. But it became by the end of your career or the end of my career, I should probably say, because I think you went on for another few years. But it was very difficult for me to beat you. And I watched you improve your swim and your bike power over those years tremendously. I think you always had a capable run, but I think the watching you trans, you know, that work ethic that you took from, like you said, that Wake Forest all the way through your career, you could just see it. And that foundation of having Val at home, and that support structure with the Olympic Training Center. Tell me a bit more about that whole relationships and teams that you had that, that helped you do what you were able to do. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. I don't think people realize that, you know, you and I are the out front people, right? Laura as well. Like we're out front, but there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that get us, gets us to the, to the finish line, gets us to the start line to actually get to where we want to be. And so for me, I mean, my team w w was obviously my wife, you know, my parents to start off, right? Ultimately my parents and that their support. I remember going out to Colorado Springs and before the Olympic games in Sydney in 2000. And I told my dad, I said, Hey, listen, you know, if I have to float you or send you a couple of credit card bills, cause I can't pay them. Or if I can't quite get, you know, this finances figured out because it's going to be a tough slog initially, these couple, first couple of years, finding sponsorship and trying to travel and do what I want to do. Will you be there for me? Will you support me? He's like, listen, I'm all in bud. You know, he would call me bud. And he's like, I'm all in with you, bud. I, I got you. I got you. I want to support your dream, but I got you to a certain point. He's like, <laughs> you know, after 2000 and maybe 0102, but if you're calling me for, for, you know, can we, can you help me out with my, with my credit card bill in 03, we, we got serious problems, serious mm -hmm. problems. And I'm like, Hey, listen, I, I don't want to be any kind of detriment to you. So he was all in. And so my parents were, 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 were the ones that started off and, and, and just loved what I did. I had that supportive mom. I'm proud to call myself a mama's boy who took me around to the practices, you know, and just you know, gave up her life in order to have me shine and, and, and be able to like do myself in sport and, and really uh, reach the top. And then my wife uh, meeting her was tremendous. Having that, that common bond of, of high level sport and, and the ability and what it takes to actually uh, be the best and try to be the best. Um, she was right there for me. I mean, she allowed me to, to wear earplugs in my ears. I mean, think about this. I mean, you weren't racing as much, but with my kids, my first kid was born in 2007. So in the lead up to the 08 games in Beijing, I didn't have to get up those three o'clock wake up calls in the middle of the night for, for my, my, my first son Davis, when he was crying and hungry and needed to be coddled and, 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 you know, and rocked or whatever, I, I would have earplugs in and I wake up and I'd be like, I turned to her and I'd be like, How'd it, how'd it go? How was the night? Like, <laughs> she's like, are you kidding me? Like, did you not hear any of that? And I was like, babe, I, these earplugs are great. Like, this is great. You're really helping me out here. And so stuff like that, that I can't believe I'm sharing with you and, and all your, you know, thousands and thousands of listeners. But I feel like, you know, that kind of support is a really big, uh, is, is a big, big deal. I had a sports psychologist, Peter Hobrell, who kept my mind right when I would go kind of south and start really getting down on myself and focus on results and not focus on the process. But think of myself as like, I'm as only as good as my, my last result, as opposed to uh, the workouts and the buildup that I've had. He was right there for me all the way from the 2000 games, all the way through 2016. So I, wow. I kind of built this infrastructure, uh, this woman named flower at the, at the dining hall, who was kind of my, my, my nutritionist, so to speak. She was also our chef in 2004 in Athens that came with us to support the triathlon team. I mean, I, I had all these people that kind of I surrounded myself and, and, and my coaches. I mean, my coach, George Dahlen, who was an amazing coach for me, Cliff English. He was my coach for the first uh, two games, uh, 2000 and 2004, Cliff English, um, who now is the coach at Arizona State University for women's triathlon, who has coached many, many uh, Olympians. He was my coach from 08 and, and, and 2012 for, for those runs, as well as my Rio run that didn't quite materialize. So, I mean, amazing coaches, amazing people, amazing support. 
And all of that goes unnoticed because you don't have time. You don't have this kind of dialogue to kind of share with people Hmm. what it takes to get to be the best. It's not us, right? It's like that iceberg, right? It's like that mentality that you see, that picture that you see. That iceberg is up on the top above the water, but that below part that you don't see is a huge bulk of ice, right? Hmm. Below the surface that none of us actually get a chance to actually see and talk about. And it's that, that's why people get emotional. You wonder why people get emotional when they're on the podium, why you and I might get emotional when we're on the podium of a big world championship event to being a world champion or or even an olympic podium it's because they're thinking back and they're hearing their flag being raised and they're thinking back upon all those that sacrificed so much for so little right in return it wasn't like they were getting paid lots of money in many cases they were doing it because the, of their passion and their drive to want to see someone that they believed in be their best and it's that sacrifice that i think coaches are making across the country and and all all types of sports all around and, and all around the world as well and so i think you know coach and support teams, it, it's so true, especially in the individual sports. It's what makes the the Roger Federer's and you know and, and all these other athletes in these different sports um, the best, right? The Jordan Spieth and golf and, and the Brooks Kafka and all these different athletes. It's because they have they they figured out a process to have these amazing support teams in place and how to make it work within their system to get them to be the best. And they they learn it pretty early on. Yeah, I think that was really well said. I think there's a lot of. Um... When I had a young mountain biker on the show, Kate Courtney, the world champion from the US, just absolutely brilliant young lady, just absolutely fantastic conversation. Um, and she, we were talking about the team that she's built around herself, which is really fantastic. Um, yes. And she was kind of describing it. Well, hang on. They truly get a hell of a lot out of it as well. And so in a sense, I'm giving them a great journey as well. So she she refused to say that I'm just, just taking. And I agree with her. I think she said, it's you know, that, that this journey is that when people see somebody going all in with passion, they want to get on board and they want to be a part of that journey. Um, there's a great, there's a great, um, the comedian Chris Rock, okay, he yeah. comes out with this quote. And excuse me, listeners, if, if I might have repeated this one. But he basically says, look, ah, my car's always breaking down on the, on the side of the highway and I'm putting uh-huh. my thumb out, thumb out and nobody ever stops. Nobody ever stops. Right. Th- then one day I just start pushing my car and uh-huh. everybody stops to help push my car because they see me pushing my car. They want to see, they want to see that you're doing something and they want to get on board to help you. And and that was what I noticed throughout my career. And exactly like you said, the, the more I went all in, the more I, I, I just was trying to do the very, very best I can. And obviously my performances, when they got better, people tended to, to be drawn to you, to want to help. But boy, it's amazing to have that group of people around you, you know, and they each play their roles. You know, you, you have your wife or your partner or, or whoever that is, that you can be a sounding board on those, on those. I won't call them depressed. I don't like that word because I think it gets overused. But those sad days and yeah. those tougher days, and you have that 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 shoulder to lean on a little bit. But yeah. then you also have this pat on the back support crew that are, are building you all the time, that are making you feel good about yourself. And cheerleaders, uh, yeah, yeah. And Chris yeah. McCormack was funny about that. He's like, yeah, somebody said, Chris, you're always surrounding yourself with people that like you. He's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, spot I don't. On. Spot on. <laughs> and, yep. uh, and so that That's was fantastic. True. And I also want to touch on you mentioned Cliff English, uh, phenomenal coach. Uh, I think what I saw him do with yourself, uh, Tim O'Donnell, yes. who's been on this show, um, the years that you guys worked with him. Just uh, I, I've seen him do some incredible things with athletes, and I know at Arizona State University what he's doing with the NCAA program down there for the women. Just an outstanding coach. So quick shout it out is. to Cliff, um, doing doing a tremendous tremendous work. The other yeah. thing that I think you've been able to do really well is the foundations and the triathlon community that you've been able to have these relationships with them, and it looks to me that you draw a lot of energy out of being a spokesperson for these foundations and things along throughout your career. Tell me a little about, about some of the foundations you've worked with, their stories, their background, and how they've sort of empowered you and inspired you. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think I've always had a heart for for kids that with disabilities. You know, I've always had a heart for kids that are less fortunate, that are born um, just with a you know, just uh, something that's been challenging for them right from the get go, you know, to no, to their f- no fault of their own. And, and they're no different than you and I, right? But they just can't do athletics or can't do sports the same way we can. And so 
um, I've always kind of had a heart for them and these kids. And so um, I, I, I first started doing work with AT Children's Project. AT stands for Ataxia Telangiectasia. And it's kids that are born with um, with uh, defect and with their gene kind of makeup, and both parents kind of have to be carriers for them to be to have ataxia telangiectasia. It's less than a thousand kids in the whole country. I mean, it's such a rare, rare disease, and um, you know they have cystic fibrosis and muscular dystrophy, and and um, it's kind of like a Lou Gehrig's for kids, and their body just starts crumbling all around them, and and and, and by the time that they're late twenties, early thirties, they'll end up passing away probably from some type of cancer, and. I, I got on board. I met a family here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Again, where I'm calling, when I'm talking to you from right now, uh, a friend of uh, kind of you know, there's some triathletes that were heading down to the Disney World uh, to do the marathon weekend, and I, I went over to play some games with them, some kind of some fun win Western games. We're playing card games, and I, I kind of hear their story, why everyone's gathered there in this house, what they're doing, and uh, I was like, hey man, I'm, I'm heading down to Florida too to see my family over the holidays. It was around Thanksgiving time frame. I'd love to, to to be a part of this in some way, and so, you know, right then and then I went I went and saw um, what their what their big event is. They have all the kids from around the country come in for the Disney Marathon weekend. The kids obviously can't do the race, but the support crew can. The t- the kids can go to the Disney World and kind of get to experience that and just kind of you know feel like normal for a little while. You know, going around and just having a good time and. It's, um, you know, when you sit, see kids dance on the dance floor in their wheelchairs or can't move the, the same way you can, it breaks my heart. And I, I just felt like I wanted to do something for them and wanted to race for them. And I did that for a while. I, I hosted my own event in, in Des Moines, Iowa, you know, in 2009. I put on my own private charity event uh, in the off season around our big triathlon there, always on Labor Day weekend. And, you know, we raised $28,000. And so for me, you know, it, I, I went home that night. It's like I won a big race. It just felt so good mm. to feel like you're contributing and you're trying to do something and give a voice to the less fortunate. It, 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 it feels good. It, it really does. It makes your heart feel good when you can do that and, and feel like you can buy all into it. I organized the event from scratch. I didn't know what I was doing. But and, and, and it sounds like, oh, not a whole lot of money. You know, $28,000 doesn't sound like a whole lot. But it would all of it went directly to AT Children's Project. And if that can, you know, help out with the research and, and, and eventually kind of be, be that catalyst and kind of go forward, I just want to do my part. And I feel like I do, like you said, I do fuel off of that. I, I, um, um, another thing, when I was in Des Moines for the high V uh, championships, I, I, I do stuff with the kids and, and, the, and the youth and the kids events. And I always around the kids events um, and doing stuff and handing out awards. And I remember that I was there the day before because they have the kids national championships the day before our event, right? That we would go and race mm-hmm. um, in 2000 and, um, um, 2010, 2011, 2012. And we're going and I'm there on my feet all day in, in the hot sun, 95 degree heat. And I'm just like, oh, no other, no, none of the other athletes are out here. What am I doing? And I just felt so concerned. And then my wife is like, listen, listen, this is you. This is who you are. You, you get, you, you get fueled up being around this and being out in the hot sun for four or five hours. Yeah, it's probably not ideal, but you're going to walk away from this feeling like you're mm-hmm. fueled up and you're giving back and you're feeling like you're a part of this. To whereas when you go out and race, you're going to be your best self. And it was, it takes someone to kind of like, not let me freak out about that to get, to get behind it. And, um, you know, you and I had some, some crazy battles there in high V. I, I, I really, you know, I'd love to ask you some questions too, because I feel like for me, I, I was really most proud of, and I would love to answer, ask you this, like, what were you most proud of in, in regards to your entire career? Our career spanned so long, you know, what was your favorite Olympics? I always get asked what are my favorite Olympics. And I'm like, well, I mean, I, I got five kids like asking what my favorite kid is. I can't, I mean, it depends on the day, right? What my favorite Olympic <laughs> is. I like that. <laughs> like, like I, I, I love Sydney for the, for the grandiose, the grandiosity of the entire event. It was our first time that triathlon was in the Olympic Games. So I just loved the idea that I was in front of the opera house, right? In front of a half a million people. And it was just crazy, you know, and, and the people that came out from Akili and, and Peter Robertson and just what they did. And, and we were featured on the first and second day. It was an amazing experience. Did I do well? No. You know, I was 17th. I didn't finish the way I wanted to, but that was okay because I was just, I got to be a part of this huge spectacle. And then in Athens for me, it was, uh, it was an amazing experience that, that it was that, that, that race and that, that event was kind of horses for certain, uh, uh, courses for certain horses. And I wasn't that horse in regards to that bike course. I mean, you and I were there, like it was 
You would you would have been another five years later in your career. I, exactly. I think, yeah, and you I just weren't quite ready for that in terms of your physique and and, what, and the time on the bike. But yeah, go on. Sorry. Exactly. No, you're you're exactly right. And so I walked away and I did what I could. I was in the third bike pack with Simon Thompson, who you said you've already had on. And I remember I'm running with him. Is we're coming to the sprint, right? And I see this guy. I'll show you guys. I'm like, I didn't I didn't quite you know who is it? It's si- it's Simon. It's Thompson, and. He's got strawberries on both of his shoulders and like on his hips. And I'm like, oh, that's brutal. And I'm starting to feel sorry for the guy. And I'm like, wait a minute. I don't have anything. I haven't gone down once in this guy. And I'm racing with a guy that's crashed twice. Like this is really humbling for someone, right? This have, like, I've actually had the perfect race in regards to like staying upright on my bike. He hasn't. And we're racing for ninth place. We're sprinting for ninth, which is not where you wanted to be. I, I thought I was going to be. I was fifth in the world going in. I had my whole crew there. The H-Dog fan club t-shirts were all out. Like I was going to do it. And I get to the race and I was just like, wow, this thing is on. And Peter Robertson and Hamish Carter and you and all these guys up the first hill at the very base of the first hill of 18% were like, game on, here we go. And I'm thinking, hold up. Aren't we all runners? Aren't we all runners here? Don't we just want to wait for the run? Let's wait to the run. We should just wait. We should ease into this race. But they were like, no, 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 no. We're going to attack it. And then two minutes later, I was in the second pack. And then the next time around, I'm in the third pack. And I'm, and I'm out there arguing with, with Whitfield and a bunch of other runners in the third pack, telling, no, you take your pole. Take your pole. Come on, do your work. And we're losing time. You know how it is. You've been in those packs where you're like, oh, no. So I'm racing Simon Thompson at the end of the finish, and I was just like, I've got to beat this guy. I mean, this guy has actually crashed twice, and now I'm still running with this guy, you know? So I did. I got him. I got, I got you there. You did get him? Yeah, I think so. Not, I, I, right? You were not. Yep, yeah, that's was my, He was 10th. Yep, yep. I, I just I, got I actually, him. What, what I loved about Simon, I think, um, just to quickly, I'm sorry to interrupt your, your train of thought. No, you no, it's there. good. It's good. But he he um, was really, really fit. In 04. Super when he qualified for that Australian team, he was almost a guy that came from nowhere. And I don't mean that in a condescending way because I know he'd been in the sport for a long time. But it was like this boom, he found himself. And and then that, you know, he won made one rookie mistake come that Olympics and he put brand new tires on for the race morning. And mm. and that was it. And, and that's what he Wow. Yeah. But imagine if that guy yeah. Had a, had, oh. He was the one attacking with Olivia Masso and yes. Bevan Dockett and Hamish Carter on that first lap. On the first lap, yep. Then he's gone yep. and had the fastest run split. Well, actually, that's not fair. You had it the fastest right. run yeah, split. Yeah, and I think Topo yep. and you yep. we will be. So yep. the, guy, the guy on that day, like you said, had two crashes. Potentially could be oh. at least talking about having a medal in his hand. For you know, sure. But, uh, I mean, sure. he didn't once complain about it or anything else. He said, I made a mistake. I made a rookie mistake, blah, 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 blah. And, and anyway, but go on. Uh, yeah. I, I love so, that I mean, too. 04 Olympics just, and then 08, yeah. 08, 08 for me going into Beijing, I mean, that was kind of being my Olympics. It's like you had mentioned, you know, I was I was world champion in, in 2005. At the time, we had a World Series champion. So I was like, I was I was champion of the entire 2005 series, world rank number one. That was a really big deer, deal for me. And then in 2000, and, uh, I remember in, in and a quick short story on that. I, I remember we were in Ishigaki um, uh, or Gamagori. We were in Gamagori for the world uh, final, for the world final. Yeah. Um, and it was in the middle of the series. We still had other races to go, right? But the world final was there. And I was world rank number one going into the race. And uh, I came out and I was just super flat. And I don't know if it was it was jet lag or whatever it was. And I was r- sprinting for 40 first place. Uh, uh, and I had number one on my leg. And I'm, I'm out there running. And Peter Robertson wins the race. And, uh, you know, B- B- Belubre, uh, Frederick Belubre from France was, was right up there as well. I mean, it was just... It was an amazing event. I finished 41st. I'm jogging back with Courtney Atkinson. I'm like, hey, man, we're going like 530 mile, 520 mile pace. And I'm like, I can't go any faster. How, how you doing? He's like, dude, I'm back here with you. It's not going well. And I actually go past Courtney and then he passes me back. And I'm like, whoa, are we racing back here? Like, what are we doing? <laughs> we're in like 41st place. Like, I know we're trying, but I mean, wow. So I finished. And then Beijing was our first test event in 2005 on the Olympic course, what was going to be the Olympic course for Beijing for the 2008 Olympics. And I wasn't going to go. It was the next week later. We were already kind of in that part of the world. And my wife was with me. And I'm like, babe, you know, my season's come to an end. Look at me. I just finished 41st. Like, this is horrible. We should just go home and regroup. Like, this is, you know, see what happens. Whatever she's like, are you are you serious? Like you're not you're not 41st kind of athlete. Like you're you're world rank number one. Like that's just a fluke. This wasn't even like you. He was like an out of body. I'm like, I know, but I mean, I'm just tired. She's like, are you? You're joking, right? Come on, we're going to Beijing. 
we go there. And then I won, I won the Nary next weekend. I won the test event mm. in a sprint, in a sprint, uh, finish with, uh, Belubre, uh, the next weekend. And, and just, Jan, Jan Ferdino was third and behind Jan, you there. Yeah. yeah, Jan, yeah. Jan Ferdino was third that, that year as well. So for me, that, that quad was a really great quad. I, I got a sports hernia in 2008 in the early part of 2008 that I had to get surgery on and I couldn't have surgery. So I was, I was the last person to qualify. It was in Des Moines was going to be our last USA qualifier. That, yeah. And it was, and Jared Shoemaker and Matt Reed are already on the team. And people thought that they wouldn't be the first ones on. I mean, they, they could have been, but Andy Potts and myself were both not on the team as of the Des Moines race. And then there was all this flooding going on in, in Iowa. And I was like, they were going to cancel the race and select somebody else. And USA Triathlon probably wasn't going to select me because they, I don't know, they want to go with somebody, go with Andy or whatever. And I was like, no, 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 no. We actually have to have a race. We got to have the event. And I was calling up my contacts in Hy-Vee saying, hey, we got to host this race. So they moved the locations to West Des Moines. They moved the whole uh, event. And um, I got to race. I finished sixth uh, that day in 2008. I was you had to be top American. I was. I beat Andy. He finished eighth. Rasmus Henning again won it. Went back to back. Mm, you got to remember gotta get, that. Like, have I, you had Rasmus? Have you had what, Rasmus on the show yet? I, I haven't, but I, I oh. might have to. I might have to. Yeah, I was crazy about that day. So the group of us were all running together. There was yes. Rasmus, Bevan, myself, Ivan, yep. Rana, Whitfield, and yourself. Yeah. And I remember I was talking to Whitfield. I and a bit like you, I. I don't know that I knew myself very well because I have a numerous stories where I thought I was flat and going to go crap and ended up having uh-huh. great days. Uh-huh. And this was another one of those days where I was just like, oh, I'll just go do it. Whatever. You know, yeah. I'll just go race, yeah. whatever. And yeah. I'm running with Whitfield about 4K in and I remember saying to him, Whitfield, you got this, mate. 200 grand, you've got this. And I'm chatting to him. Yeah. All of a sudden, <laughs> Rasmus goes and I said, come on, Simon, you've got to get back up to him. And suddenly, Simon's not doing anything. And I'm like, hang on. <laughs> Maybe it's, I, yeah, maybe, maybe it's me. Maybe I should maybe, try and get back maybe. up there. And I, I ran and ran and ran and, and Bevan went with me and, and uh, in the end, Bevan out sprinted me for for second and Rasmus went away with it. And I was just like, it was one of those ones where you looked away and go, you idiot. Yes. Have, have more confidence Confident. in yourself. It's it's like my my it's biggest your, well, regret throughout my, my career was my lack of confidence. And if I could go – Back to my 17-year-old self, I'd slap myself in the face and say, be more confident and just see what comes about. And that's something – that was a process that I had to continually work on. And Laura was very good for me with that. But at times, boy, I screwed up with things like that. (laughs) But Yeah. Yeah, but I remember that race for you. I remember it was a really big deal. You and Andy were – Andy Potts. Andy Potts, who I haven't had on the show yet either, but one of America's other great athletes of this last sort of 15 years and, um, and an incredible athlete. You know, Andy Potts oh, is huge engine, and huge so engine. so to beat the guy, you've got to be on to beat him. And, yeah, and you were, and I think you know, yeah, getting six and eight, and you know who split you guys? Alistair Brownlee was right. Oh, that's YouTube. right, that's right. <laughs> Alistair was, he was. Uh, I know he was a young kid, like what, 18, yeah. 17 years yeah. old. Yeah, uh, coming up, he, he couldn't have been much older than that. No, yeah, but I, he, I he was the one that split you guys apart. Yeah, my thing was, I I, I tell Andy, I tell him, I'm like, listen, I, I helped your, I, I I motivated you and moved you into your Ironman career, maybe a little bit quicker than you otherwise would have gone, because he went and raced Kona that very yeah. same year in 2008. Yeah. You know, so I, I kind of boosted him along. So you know, for me. You know, Beijing was going to be my games. And I went to the doctor afterwards and I was like, hey, I've got this, we got this hernia, this sports hernia. Like, what do I do? And he's like, well, we have surgery. That's all you really can do is kind of put a mesh pad in there and, and kind of heal it up. And so for me, that wasn't an option before Beijing. I couldn't, that was going to take me way too far out of the game. He's like, well, we can give you some local anesthetic, like some local injections to try to like, you know, ease the pain that might last a while. And I was like, oh, like local injections in the growing, that doesn't sound good at all. And I was like, okay. So I did. And, uh, and, and it kind of carried me through. I mean, it, it helped out somewhat, but that was, that was, that was my games. I mean, that ultimately, I didn't have the fitness level going in the way I should. I was dealing with that sports hernia off and on. I, I got up to the level that I possibly could, but the course was perfect for me. Everything was, was just so in my wheelhouse, the way the bike course was with the rolling hills, the way the run course was where there were some kind of rollers in there as well, the swim. I mean, I, I, I was third out of the water. I mean, for me, it was an amazing swim. You know, I just mm. followed the guy from China who went absolutely crazy the first 300 meters and I went on his feet and then he kind of realized, wait a second, it was 1500 meter swim, not a 400 meter swim. <laughs> and then the race wasn't done at the first buoy. So then he peels off and I was like, oh, thank you very much. And I had the cleanest swim, me and Shane Reed. It was like, it was awesome. It was, it was an, the whole, the whole race was just 
perfect for me, dialed in. I took it out and transition two was kind of leading. Then Brad, Alistair comes by me. He takes it on. I just couldn't match the intensity and the drive. And, and as it continued to get ramped up throughout it with Whitfield and, and Jan and, 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 and Javi was in there and, and Rana was, he's the one of that. He second was driving lap. it. Oh, yes. Boy, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He, he absolutely pushed it. Yeah. It was, um, and then the other German, who, where was the other German guy from? The Daniel, Unger. Uh, Daniel Unger. Unger. Daniel Unger. Yeah. Daniel Unger. Uh, yes. So yeah. Daniel's in there and it's just, that was, that was my race. That would have been, I mean, if, if I could have been more healthy going in, that was my games. When you say what, what course really suits you, yeah. that would have been my, my course. But again, I was happy with seventh. I mean, you, you think, oh, you finished ninth in Athens and you were, I was kind of disappointed for, you know, for me. And I finished seventh in, in Beijing. Oh, you're excited about that. But it's all, it's all relative in, in how you're dealing with your injury and, and your training going into the games. And I, I was, I was ecstatic with that and, and, and being a part of those games. And then after 08 is when I kind of really made the decision to go more uh, uh, U.S. races, right? Non-drafting events, the, the high V's, the, um, the Lifetime Fitness Series, I mean, in, in a major way. I mean, obviously, I did Lifetime. We did Lifetime back in the day with, uh, uh, you know, the, the big cash. And those were fun days, right? I mean, did, have you described yet when they would walk in? So Lifetime Fitness, if I can set this up, they, they, they decided uh, Barama Krati, the CEO of Lifetime, wanted to put on this major event, and he wanted to have the guys and the girls go head-to-head. But he wanted to figure out, how can I do that? And he thought to himself, well, if I, if I actually give the girls a head start, you know, maybe it's 10 minutes, whatever it is, in an Olympic distance race, we'll come up with a quadratic formula in order to create to whereas the girls have a certain amount that there can be a guy chasing down the women at the very end and be an actual sprint finish for the cash. And the first year, I think maybe was it $50,000 the very first year, yeah. but then they quickly went to $200,000, which to put it in perspective for all you guys listening and gals listening out there is that. Our, what's our what's our typical prize purse Five, to win to win is five thousand ten thousand dollars to win exactly maybe, maybe fifteen thousand dollars so to have two hundred thousand dollars everyone it was the best it was the best athletes in the world eighteen of the best men you would get like chosen to come to this event eighteen of the best women and we'd fly in and they would walk a guy down the pro meeting with a briefcase full of cash with a with a with a like a handcuff tied to it and it was just like this so like. <laughs> Awesome made for TV. I mean, I just, I just loved it. And sure enough, you know, Baran just being the nice guy, I feel like gave the women a little bit too much time, right? Because the women won it every what, year, the, every, every year. year, every year for the first, what, four years, no, right? Mate. The first it, four or five years. It was crazy. They just one, got, two, three, four, and five. Yeah. They, five they, years. Yeah, five years. Yeah. 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 And then in 2005, I, and then I told my wife, when they won it in 2004, again, I was like, I told Val after, I was like, baby, they're either going to eventually shut this race down. Actually, that's not right. I think Crowey. He won it in 05. Corey won it in 05. But was it still men versus women in that one? It was still it, men versus women. Yep. Oh, so he won, he won that one. Okay, okay. He won that one. Yeah, yeah. He won that one. And then after that, it's when I was I was kind of close. We were all kind of close. And then I told my wife, I go, I got to win this thing before they shut this thing down and realize it's they're giving away too much money. Like, Baram doesn't need to give away $200,000. We would all come for a hundred or, you know, $50,000, right? I mean, in comparison. <laughs> so I show up. And in 2006, I was able to win in 2006 the, the one-off race, which was an amazing time for me in regards to the timing of it. I had just bought my first house. We were pregnant with our first child, my wife and I. So the two the two hundred k and the Toyota Rav Four that I won as well. It was it was it was so perfectly timed, and it all went into our brand new home and to kind of starting a family. It was just it was amazing. And then that year after you, they decided Brom was like, okay, I'm out of this. That was the last year, the guys versus girls. And then he said, hey, let's make this thing a whole series, make it an entire series. We'll put big money on each, and then we'll say we'll give a kicker. And I'm saying this for you too. We're going to give this kicker. Was it a half million? It was a half a million dollars. A half a million dollars. That if everyone, if, if someone wins all five events, which no way. I mean, that's not going to happen. You're not, I mean, it's like golf. Like you don't win five straight tournaments. You're not going to win five actual triathlons. Then we'll give them a half a million dollars. And sure, no, sure enough, it was Greg Bennett, you, my friend, who actually <laughs> pulled it off. It was it was unbelievable. Can you share with me a little bit about that? About that year? <laughs> but, but, I want to know what, more. I want to know more. What's crazy about all of that 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 time is we all we all left going. Well, that's it's just stupid now because now they're not giving us the same kind of money, right? We we're like, ah, oh, screw right. you, Ram. You know, right? Damn it, we've we've missed our turn. Like you said, you got to take advantage of the opportunity when it's there. And and so for me, it was 
and I think for all of us, we were looking at people like Emma Snowsill could pot- yeah. potentially be the women that that um, she was winning everything in the non drafting in the US. Plus, she was winning you know the uh, the I, the IT World Cup series and all the World Cups, and she was the world champion and blah blah blah. She was just phenomenal. We turn up to the first race, Minneapolis, and. Uh, and what was interesting about that first race in 07 Minneapolis, it was also the final of the 06 series. And the 06 series started the week after the Minneapolis that you won in 06. That's right. That's and so right. We did New York, Chicago, and, Lo- and Los Angeles. Yeah. And so I think I'd won New York and uh, Los Angeles, and Crowe yep. had won, Greg Alexander had won Chicago. And I think he'd been second to me. Um, at the other two or whatever. So I was going in with a slight lead, but basically it was whoever won Minneapolis in 07 would win that 06 season where they had put up a decent extra bonus as well. And and so I was just focused on Minneapolis to win the 06 series. And I focused for seven months, just abs- everything I could was just dialed in about that race. And then boom, I, I happened to win. But what was interesting was Emma Snowsill got beaten by um, Fernandez. Um, what's her first name? Excuse me, listeners. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Vanessa, 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 Vanessa. excuse yep. me, Vanessa. Yep. I'm sorry yep. if you're listening. Yep. Vanessa yep. Fernandez. Yeah. And Vanessa was an outstanding athlete on her own right, a world champion, but she came over from Portugal and boom, yes. beat Emma Snowsill. So, and I think Vanessa was only ever looking at doing that one race. So now poor old Emma, her chance of winning all five was over. Right. So now I've won the first and now this chit chat starts happening. Okay, Greg, can you do, you know. You know. Yeah. Well, New York had been my, Favorite race, favorite race. Like you oh, described yeah. Beijing. So New York with the down current swim meant I could get out of the water right behind Craig Walton, probably the greatest, right. the greatest swim biker in the, that we've ever seen in the sport. And I could That's get out of the true. water 15 it seconds. Was- and, and then we had like a half mile run. So I could even catch him, you know, running barefoot down to the transition and, and get on 12 the minute bike. swim. Yeah, it was a 12 yeah, minute swim. 12 yeah. minute yeah. swim. <laughs> so, and, and, yeah. And, and I think I'd won, yeah, I'd won New York the year before. And, and so I, I kind of felt like, with the hills along the Hudson Highway, oh yeah, uh, that it All really worked. In, yeah, it really worked into my favor that. that and uh, so yep. I came back in off the bike, and and I think I had, I think I had a lead. I don't know. I can't remember that race. Anyway, yep. I, I ended up winning New York, and and I, um, so now it was two from two, and now now there's a bit more chit chat. Everyone's like, oh, oh, this guy might be a what. And I knew going into the third race, which would be my least favorite, would be the Chicago Triathlon. And right. not least favorite in terms of Chicago. I love the city and I love the, right. the event, but it's dead flat. Dead yep. flat. The swim is very honest. Um, and what I mean by that, it's hard to get a good draft. You know, there's, there's you know, the, the water's often fairly choppy. choppy so yes. Someone like a Craig Walton could open up a big gap and then the yep. dead flat bike, uh, he can just go and – and I remember going into it going, I had my running really going well in 07. I was really ramped it up and I was, I was doing some incredible work. And, um, and I was like, well, if I can keep Craig within two and a half minutes off the bike, potentially I could, I could get him. Um, yep. And so I, um, I get off the bike and I think it was like a two minutes 45. And I was like, oh, no. And I just was like, just sprint. Yeah. So I, sprinted i sprinted and sprinted and i caught him by about five or six k really early like i don't know uh-huh. what i ran that first 5k in, but it was nuts you know when you just go crazy yeah and then i caught him and then he i suddenly had massive cramps and i was like oh no oh no oh no and i i, I managed to just beat him it actually wasn't uh-huh. quite much in the end just a quick mini break before we get back to the show. I just want to remind you guys to go check out athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. Sign up and get your free 20 daily travel packets with your first order of $79 added value. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. So now I've won three. And, oh, yeah. and I was like, okay, um, what a, you know, now the pressure's really building. So really it was just about taking one race at a time. I really, yep. by this stage, I knew I'd won the 07 series, yep. um, which there was a decent bonus for already. So I was like, okay, right. this is good. So then I go to Los Angeles. The surf swim I knew would suit me. Um, yes. The the bike course maybe suited Waldo. Craig Walton was my menace during this year. He was just... Yep. Um, and anyway, I have a pretty good swim, but Craig Walton just takes off on the bike and just... I think has one of the most phenomenal 40k bike splits I think I've ever seen in the sport because I rode well. I uh-huh. you know when you have your SOM your wattage and I think yep. I was riding like 
I, I think I was around that 350 watts um, for the first 10 kilometers. And, you know, I've got to remember I'm 68 kilos. So it was pretty, and he rode away from me. And then I, yeah. the next sort of 30K, I probably held around that 310 to 320, but he was gone. And I got off the bike and I thought, oh, well, maybe I can still get him. Who knows? And, and I hear somebody yell out, 310. <laughs> I was like, you know, my first reaction, and this is the Den Orton's truth, was good, it's over. The pressure's over. Yeah, wow. What a terrible wow. reaction. Yeah. It was just like the pressure and everybody talking about it. I was just so done with it. And then yeah. I guess I thought about that for about one or two seconds. It really yeah. wasn't that. And right. then I was like, no, you you do, you do sprint and just see what happens. And as it turns out, the the LA tri course where you you run from oh, the brutal. convention, what's it called, the um, the basketball, the uh, the, yeah, the forum, like the LA. Or whatever yep. it is, and you run yep. up to the Disney Hall and you come yep. back down. And that's where my downhill speed, you know, I just remember just going, let go. If I fall, I fall. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You have to sprint the downhill. And anyway, on the second lap of two, I, I, I get down the bottom of that hill. He's now only about 200 meters in front. I just sprint all the way up to him with probably 200 meters to go. We're neck and neck. I, I still can't get rid of him. And I'm like, come on. I just took yeah. three minutes out of you. Give it to me. Anyway, he, <laughs> he took me right to the finish. And yep. it was about six seconds. And then there was a murmur, did you know, did Craig let Greg win kind of thing, you know, because uh-huh. it was like we never, ever discussed anything. Trust me. We were both yeah. very competitive. Um, right. and, then, and then the final race is very interesting in Dallas. In Dallas, because yeah. I decided to fly with Laura to Beijing um, because she had her Olympic trials in 07 in Beijing yep. and she hadn't yep. made 04. She'd, Laura uh, was ranked number two in the world going yes. to Athens. She'd finished third at the world champs the year before, second, no, second at the world champs in 03, third yes. at the world champs in, in Madeira in, in 04, but still got left off the US team. So yeah. she, for her, we were like, she has, above all else, Laura needs to go to the Olympics. We need to yep. make this happen. So I had to go with her. I didn't have to, but that was a, the number one priority for me was to actually go to Beijing with her right in the middle of LA and Dallas, which was right. about a, a six-week window. I go yeah. to Beijing. We have a good time after she finishes third, makes the US Olympic team. We actually party pretty hard. We have a good time. And I come back and I'm injured. I'm uh-huh. injured. I don't run for the four or five weeks into Dallas. And then I, I fly my chiropractor, Alex Keith, uh, yep. to, to Dallas and he works on me from 2 a.m. And, uh, and and we get the body going. I don't even really study the course too much. I'm just like just trying to ease my mind, not even think about it. And long story short, I kind of faked my way. I remember getting off the bike in, in Dallas and just going, just sprint because everybody thinks you still got the running and I remember getting around the corner. Oh, here's a side story for you. So, you know, Bill Burke is the race director. He puts yes. on these big races, high V, everything else. And Bill Burke yes. says, uh, I, I measure the course before getting to the 07 race. And the bike, I think the bike was 42K or something. And that's fine. You know, a couple uh-huh. of K over, a couple of K under, doesn't matter. Yeah. I measured the run course and it was 9.6K. Now, I'm thinking back to LA where I've just beaten Craig Walton in the first last couple hundred meters going, no, 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 no. It has to be an accurate 10 K. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the run course was downtown Dallas. So it was quite easy to add an extra block. A run you know. block. Yeah. Yeah. And so I write Bill Burke months before and say, Bill, I've measured the course on Google earth and it's short. And he says, Greg, okay, I'll have a look. And they looked at it. They said, yeah, it's short. So they added another city block. I get I get to two k into the the uh, into the race. I've I've overtaken Matt Reed for the lead. Yep. I run past the street that we were originally meant to run down, knowing that I've I've lost some fitness because I haven't been doing any training and everything. And I was kicking myself. I was spewing because <laughs> I'd already caught Craig Walton on the bike and everything else. Yeah. And so here I was uh, faking it for the first five k. Anyway, I held off a fast charging uh, Philip Osplay and Bevan Doherty and managed to take the win. And so that sorry everybody that's come on to listen to Hunter Kemper, but you did. No, ask, but that's no. my O my O seven yes. here. And 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 you talked about and originally you kind of said. Um, what are some of the highlights of your life and, and, yes. or, or your career? And obviously, yes. 07 was special. I think, um, you know, there's there's several others, but that was definitely, you know, a relief, joy, 
everything else. It was a very special time. Yeah. I, I think it's special because like you said, I mean, there is, re- there's gotta be a, a big sense of relief because I mean, that was the biggest prize purse we've ever thrown at something ever in, in our sports history. Right. I mean, to win Kona, it was $125,000 and high V and lifetime fitness before that was doing 200 K to win. You know, yeah. and I remember you and I would always kind of say why, why, you know, we had the kind of the similar quotes, like why in the world we would want to go out and slog ourselves for eight hours out in Kona when we can win $200,000 and do it in an hour and 45 five minutes well that was know? always even chris mccormack when i had him on said you know he kind of he said i always loved the short course racing more than kona he said i never enjoyed iron man i said you know and i said well at least you got to win two yes. world championships i mean it's, it's right. not bad man. i mean you did you did pretty well you know the other fascinating thing when i was doing homework for this show was when i mentioned in the introduction that there's two guys that have done four olympics um well the other guy is simon whitfield and yes. Simon, with his gold medal and a silver medal, did them very, very well. Very but well. He's also um, the only other guy that's also won Minneapolis and High V, as you have done. Yes. Okay. Yes. So now I've won Minneapolis and High V, but I didn't go to four Olympics, so I don't get to join that little group of yours. It's really quite outstanding because basically, post the Lifetime Series, is we did start to have this High V triathlon that came around for for many many years, and uh, you oh, know, seven so to fourteen, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. and they, they do tend and to come in these seven year blocks. These they do, events. they do, and they were a big sponsor of mine, right? I remember Bur- B- Bill Burke was uh, got brought on by High V in two thousand and six to kind of put on this race. They, they go. Their, their idea, Rick Jurgens was the CEO of Hy-Vee at the time. And yeah. Hy-Vee, again, so you guys, if you guys know, it's a grocery store chain based in the Midwest of, uh, of the United States of America in Des Moines, Iowa, of all places, is where they're headquartered. And they wanted to, they're going to eventually, they were going to showcase their their um their health uh, uh market and their health area of their store they wanted to kind of have a little part a little market within their store of a lot of healthy foods and they wanted to showcase that by having an event that they were a sponsor of to say listen we believe in health and wellness we support that look at our stores um and so it was a really cool concept they wanted to be the masters of 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 some kind of race was it going to be running or marathons or you know just running in general maybe maybe not and they end up choosing triathlon and they brought bill burke on built and they said they wanted an athlete and then and bill you know i was lucky enough to kind of be considered for that so i was a sponsor there from 2007 all the way until 2014 when the, the last race that they actually had and and for me it was an amazing kind of experience to work with mm-hmm. a company that really cared about the athlete and uh and and was in it for a lot of a lot of a lot of different reasons but a lot of it was the charity component as well they would do a charity auction event on the Thursday, Friday night before the Sunday, you know, kind of race weekend. And I would always come in for that and be a part of this auction. And they would always ask me, I mean, after Rasmus Henning, won it, uh, uh, this guy, Rasmus Henning out of Denmark, he's, he won the very first uh, two high V triathlons so that were $200,000. So over two years, he'd won $400,000 and a couple of uh, hum- Hummers, right? You want a couple of Hummers? No, just well? a Hummer on the first year because I think. Oh, a Hummer on the first year. He, his victory right. speech might have uh, con- eliminated ended that. the Hummer. <laughs> yeah. It was so a, he, a little bit green, everybody, which which is okay, but I think Hummer were a bit upset. <laughs> they were, yeah. So he he won the first two years, and then they would they would ask me like after that they're like. So what do you think? You think you're going to be able to win this thing? And I was like, you know, guys, I, I am trying like my hardest. I mean, this is this is a focus for me. I want to let you know that this is like my. We have A, B, and C races. This is an A one. This is always A. When you get a chance to win two hundred thousand dollars, it's like your gold standard race. I'm trying, but I go. There's a lot of other athletes that are the best in the world that are coming here that are also trying because it's also their A race too. No one's slacking. No one's like, oh, I got something else next week, and it's like this is the deal, <laughs> you know. So I'm like, I'm, I'm doing, it. and every year, you know, I mean, you want it. Uh, uh, Javier Gomez won it a, a couple of times, and then as it's um, and I tell Val, I'm like, man, I I feel, I feel like I got I got to pull this out for my sponsor, and I got in, I had gotten second place like a couple of years in a row to you to Gomez, all before finally I got the chance to win it in 2013, uh, in, in and it was and then in 14. I mean, it was it was an amazing run, and I was really proud of myself that I got to win big, big races that people really, really cared about. And that were big money events like Lifetime Fitness that everyone was going for in 06 and like uh, High V in, in, in 2013 and 2014. And for me, it was a really, really big deal. And they were both non-drafting races, which for me, from where I came from, people, you know, oh, you can't ride your bike like Greg Bennett. You can't, you don't know how to ride your bike. You don't, you can't produce that kind of power like Craig Walton. And I really kind of took offense to it. Like, you know, I can, if I, if I devote myself and I, and I turn myself into a cyclist for this particular race, uh, I, I can do that. And so I was really proud of myself and my career that I was able to win 
even though it didn't happen at the Olympic Games, for me, uh, when, when, when people were going for lifetime fitness on the biggest day, on, on a huge event, I was able to win and I was able to win high V as well. And it was, it was something I really, you know, hold dear to me. And I think, you know, you and I always talk about like, you know, how do you judge people about, you know, who's the best over, over, over careers, right? How do you ever really tell? Is it Simon Lessing? Is it Simon Whitfield? And one of the things I think you and I always talk about is, you know, it should be based upon prize money too, right? Because prize money, it, it isn't every other sport. It's judged by how much money do you win in your career? What's your overall haul and, and how much money you brought home in terms of prize money? It's, it's how, it's how one, I feel like how athletes should be considered. And I felt like for me, it, 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 I was very proud of winning on big days, big, big races, big money events. And, uh, you know, and I know it's something that you, you hold dear as well. And it's, it's, well, it's funny I'm, I'm when, when, you, when you retired and I think I sent you a note and it was one of those, you know, you, you think about yourself mostly and then you, your competition a little bit less, but I started going through, and then especially even for this show, but more so a couple of years ago when I, I wrote you and I started going through your career and, and everybody always wants to talk about the going to four Olympics. Okay, great. But for me, I look at the career highlights for you and some of the biggest performances that you delivered and many of which I was on the backhand of, uh, it was, it was the, those big money races. And, and the, what I've done is I've, I've put the, the, I have a list of the 50 greatest triathletes of all time. And I actually went on Chris McCormack's, uh, podcast, um, a number of weeks ago and, uh, I think I forgot what it's called, mxendurance.com. Anyway, yeah, we uh, yeah, and we yeah. chatted about the top 10 of all time. And yeah. But the way I break it down is, first and foremost, I want to know that you're a triathlete. So yep. I rank it in a percentage. So you get 15% to swimming, uh -huh. 15% to biking, and 15% to running. Uh huh. Now, someone like uh, Peter Robinson, who's won three world yep. titles and come second twice in the ITU World Series, yep. phenomenal athlete, right? Yes, but his swim and bike wasn't always there. He had to really, he had just a phenomenal run and he was a fantastic racer and knew how to win that ITU type racing. Yes. But when I measure up his scoreboard compared to a Jan Fadino who could do swim, bike and run at a very, very high level, it was very hard for me to give Peter Robinson the same kind of points in the swim and bike. Anyway, yes, yes. For, so 45% goes to swimming, biking and running. Yep. So then we have 20% goes to your titles. Okay, so like a Peter Robinson's getting close to 20 out of 20. You win three World IT World yep. Championships. Phenomenal. Yep. Uh, you know, Dave Scott, Mark Allen, six Iron yep. Man World Title, yep. all of that. Those guys, yes. titles, 20%. Yes. Then 20% yes. goes to prize money. Now, obviously, prize money has to do with the availability of prize money. Like yes. you're talking Dave Scott in the 80s, yes. where he's getting a trophy for winning Kona and zero right. prize money. Well, that's not fair. I mean, right. so it has to be in accordance to what was available during yes. your time and then finally i add the final 15 percent. 10 percent goes to your ability to cross over varying distances so super sprint through to iron man someone like a greg walsh you know yes could race yes. the grand prix in australia win and take it up against brad bevan who was just phenomenal yes. he could win a itu world championship and world cup series when they became draft legal and duathlons and then he won kona iron man so he did everything and and everything and that was phenomenal um so he he would get a you know 10 out of 10 points and then the final piece of the puzzle i'd give five percent to your ability to do longevity because i think there's this sustained effort it's one thing to get to the top of the world it's another one yes. to be able to sustain it and so you know obviously yes. someone like yourself you'd get your you know five out of five right, i mean right, it's not a high right. percentage right um but then i ended up and we ended up and this was the big debate with Macca, and we had a bit of fun we, we were left with four and that was mark allen Alistair Brownlee, Javier Gomez, and Jan Fadino. Um, yes. And just outside the big four, you'd have sort of Simon Lessing, um, Greg yes. Walsh. I think Simon yes. Whitfield was in the top 10. Yep. Um, but but yep. those guys were all in there. And uh, But it's a fantastic little discussion. I, it is. But I, I think you and I, the way we approached it as professional athletes, yes. is when you look at the prize money, you take out the middleman and you don't have to be as concerned about sponsorship. You know what I mean? It's like, right. or you could go to Ironman where the prize money might not be there, but then you work harder On to the gain the sponsor side. So, I mean, look, everybody can do it the way they want. Um, I feel like you and I both optimized ourselves and what was available in the sport. Now, before we just keep rabbiting on, I want to I want to talk about some of the things that you did to step yourself up Um from being, look, a, a decent athlete on the World Cup Series to be one of the guys that's like, okay, okay, Hunter's on form, we're in trouble, yeah, which I yeah. think really for me, 
I look at that sort of 05 ish onwards. I think there was yes. a real step. Now, I, I guess if you could break it down for me, did you find that was there something that you did? Was there a more of an intent uh, look at your what you're doing as an athlete when you look at sleep and nutrition, body work, your, your general health or your training or your yes. mental strategies? Just tell me about that period in your life and what changes yep. you made. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. You know, when I got into elite level racing, I came in and won my very first U.S. national title in '98, and I was going against, uh, you know, Greg Welch was in the race and Nick Rakowicz, and you know, and I and I came right on to winning a, a U.S. national title in '98, and so I kind of felt myself as the big fish in the small pond, so to speak. Right? I, I, I became, like you said, I mean, I went, I went on to Sydney. And I was, I was 17th, but I was top American. And I, for some reason, I kind of stayed in that area of excitement. I always kind of put top American. Like I always kind of, like I, I was the man within the U.S. And that was good enough for me. For some reason, I never looked at myself, never thought to myself ever to go to four Olympic Games and make a career of 20 years in a sport that I loved. I never thought about doing it like that, that could sustain and support myself. But I think I became complacent a little bit enough to be like, I'm the best in the country. That gets me some recognition. That's giving me some good sponsorships. That's giving me this, you know, whatever. And then I went on to 04. I trained really, really hard for 2004 for the Athens Games. I was 28 years old. I was I was fifth in the world rankings going in. Um, and I and I really truly believed. And and Sydney, I didn't believe I could actually win. I didn't believe in my my heart I could actually win it. And in 2004, I did believe I could do it. I didn't expect the course to be as challenging with the with the other athletes on there yourself and 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 Hamish Carter and 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 Bevan and the guys Olivier to take it out the way they did on that course Sven Reeder so I I was almost I misjudged the level of how high intensity it would be within the athletes going and attacking the course the way they did but I went for it I came home from Athens and I was crushed I really was I my sister two hours after the race was like hey hey Hunter just think you know, you finished 17th in Sydney. You just finished ninth here. You do the math. You do eight better again. You're going to win Beijing. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Lee, like that's so comforting. I know you're trying to cheer me up, but this is really raw right now. It's like two hours post. And that's like four years from now. Like anything can happen. So I'm like, I know you mean well, but this doesn't work that way. It's like four years away. But I came home and I was crushed. I was like, what am I doing wrong? But I was doing a lot of things wrong. I was the athlete that, you know, my parents, my, my dad's kind of a bigger guy. I, I didn't focus on my nutrition. I, I, my idea was of nutrition was I could eat whatever I wanted to whenever I wanted to. What, whatever kind of food, whether it be fast food or junk food or whatever it was, because that was fuel too, right? I didn't see it as the wrong kind of fuel. I just said, I just thought I wasn't going to be able to gain weight. So this is good. I'm still skinny. It must be okay. And I came back in 05 and I say, and I and I had all these all these facilities at the training center around me. And I'm like, I've got to dive deeper into this. I've got to focus on my nutrition. And I read this article that said, never go hungry. The title of it was never go hungry, never go thirsty. And my sports psychologist gave it to me, Peter Hoberl. And he said, Hey, I want you to read this. And I read it and it really changed my entire idea behind sports nutrition and the timing of when we eat and why we're eating to, you know, throughout the day. And I was like, wow, never go hungry. Start eating smaller meals throughout the day. Start eating right after a hard workout and replace, replenish the muscles that you've broken down. Let's get a protein source in there within 30 minutes. Oh, that might be important to reduce the lactic acid, to reduce the soreness for next day's workout. Let's focus on recovery in a way we've never done on recovery. You're getting older. Let's do that. So nutrition, I dove totally into and, and really became kind of not fanatical about it, but really, really serious about my nutrition, very, eating very, very healthy, eating the right sources of meats and the right sources of protein and the right sources of carbohydrates. The, the timing of when I ate was really important. Going to bed on time, going to bed earlier, not staying up later, going to bed more like that 9, 30, 10 o'clock range, getting up earlier, kind of still getting the same amount of sleep, but different kind of sleep, right? Maybe better because it's a lot of sleep studies say it's, it's very important that if you can go to bed at 9, 30, 10 o'clock, that sleep to six in the morning or 5 30 in the morning, it's much better than a 11 30 at night to 7 30. Those eight hours is not nearly as good. So, learning these things, I went into 05 a different person with a different kind of like, you know what? 
I'm good enough to be best in the world. I've seen little glimmers here and there. I just had the best run split at the Olympic Games. I'm the best in the running in this, you know, you and I, like right, right there, right? Well, I'm the best in, 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 in running in this sport right now. Let me take it a step further and try to be the best in the world. And I did that in 05. That's one reason why I attribute to, to the 05 season being my world number one world championship season, world rank number one. And then in 06, I continued it on where I was leading the world in that season all the way until I got an injury uh, late in the year and and then and kind of had a poor, uh, you know, sixth or seventh place finish at the world champs in Lausanne, the one that Tim Don won uh, when he bridged across. I'm sure he had talked about that in his uh, in his episode uh, that was aired. And so I feel like for me, um, it was one of those things that I just recalibrated and just refocused that I'm going to be the best in the world. What does it take to be the best in the world? I've got to start doing the little things. It's not good enough just to be the best in the country. I can't hang my hat on that anymore. It's I'm too good. I need to be better. And let's focus on bike power. And let's focus on every little aspect of my career and my life and, and see how I can be better. And my wife was right there with me every step of the way. And so it was a big change. I, I made it then. And that's, and I think obviously you can see the results were different from 05 on. Mm -hmm. I really made a conscious decision that, you know, I don't know how long I have in this sport. I didn't know it was going to be that many more years longer. I'm going to give it all I have and, and see if I can be the best in the world. And it really felt good to know at the end of 05 that I was the very best. It was hard to sustain through injuries. I had some real um, hip flexor and some mm -hmm. SI joint struggles all through like uh, 07, 08, kind of in the sports turning, that kind of stuff. But it was, I, I was really, I was something I'm really, really proud of to, to finish the season as the best in the world and be world rank number one. It's not an easy feat to do. Oh, oh and you should be, mate. And, and I think, uh... What what about you? What about you? Your, your your training did that change at all? Did you kind of, was that when you joined Cliff English as a coach? It or? was, yeah. yeah. In the training too, I mean, I think Cliff, what, what he is really good at is he's really good at identifying the athlete and knowing when to kind of press on and knowing when to hold back. Right. I think what makes a good coach is not delivering so much and, and giving them so much that, you know, the best survive kind of thing. It's, I think it's knowing the athlete and knowing kind of what we have to do to get that athlete better. And, and also knowing when the athlete's struggling on a hard day and when they're truly struggling, as opposed to, and they just want to bail out of it and just kind of fake it, you know, or whatever. I think for me, I mean, Cliff was good at kind of like pulling myself back on hard workouts when I just was too cooked from the day before or whatever. For me, training became more more specific, more tailored to the actual courses that I was going to do. I mean, you talked and mentioned about how you were preparing for Minneapolis and, you know, in 07 for like mm. eight months, right? That mm. type of mindset is kind of what I had for my goal uh, a, a races. Like, what, mm. what do I need to do in order to be the best in Beijing, right? Like knowing that course and knowing that consistent rollers on the bike and the power output, I need to kind of simulate that train in my training. I just can't go train differently than what the race course is going to give me and what the athletes are going to give me. And so, and how hot is going to be there, right? So acclimatizing and putting myself in hot environments to where I, was, I mean, I did a bulk of my training in Colorado Springs because I felt like altitude training was really, really good for me. I, I, I really felt a sense of a benefit when I came down from altitude and raced at sea level. So I just focus on knowing, okay, what's the goal race that I'm trying to do? What am I trying to win at? And tailoring my training around those events that I want to be really, really good at, as opposed to like, so if it's, if it's, if it's all Olympics, right? If it's the Olympic year, we're doing draft legal style of training. So what does that mean? Well, that means you got to have a little bit more of a, of a start and stop short spurts mentality on the bike, right? It's high workload, but it, maybe it's only for two minutes at a time as opposed to sustained work for 15 to 20 minutes at one time, right? Mm -hmm. So it's different like cat and mouse kind of like um, – Far more that, VO2 work, far, far more of that 40-second type to 90-second type efforts and, one, and that 100%, kind of thing. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. 100%. And then the same with the running too. I mean, you know, knowing right out of the gate, like on that 10K, you got to, you know, you got to establish yourself that first 2K and then settle back in and the changes of, and the changes of pace. I mean, it's much more of a, not a steady state, but it's much more of a kind of cat and mouse game and VO2 game as well on the run for Olympic distance too. But I think what people underestimated was that it's still a 10K. And 10K is a long way. It's 30 minutes of running roughly, right? So 30 <laughs> minutes, there's a lot to do. There's a lot of damage to do in that last 15 minutes. Yeah. So I felt like for me, I think people sometimes could go out way, way too hard. And I would go out hard, but I would not over, over, uh, overdo it and over redline it. And then I would have some in the reserves. And I think 
I think I think marathoners have proven that the, the world records in the marathon they're always when you back half your races. So for, so for all you listening out there, if you want to run a PR and anything and any kind of event that you want to do from 10k on up, it's going to basically be you get to 5k and that that second 5k has to be fa- a little bit faster than that first. You can't go out so fast that you're blown up and and have nothing to give the last half of the race. So I was very good at doing that and and I knew my body well. That's awesome. And you touched on uh, Peter Hobrell, your, your sports psychologist. Were you working with him a lot in visualizing specific for events or how did, what mental strategies were you, were you practicing? Yeah, it's, that's a great question. You know, I mean, him and I, a lot of times I would talk to him, even outside of sport, he would get my mind right of just about just daily life, right? Not, not, not necessarily within sport, but just outside. I would, I would come to him with all kinds of problems and, and, and just in, and, and my family, my kids, my wife, you know, whatever, and just kind of work through things. But he would also get me right on the race course and we would do a lot of mindfulness. And I know that term's been tossed around and what it really means is being kind of in the moment, in the present. And I think a good way to relate to that is, you know, a lot of times we might like say drive a car down a highway, right? And we might be going down the highway and then we're thinking about other things or we're listening to other things like this podcast, for example, or whatever we're doing, right? As we're moving along and we can't ever recall the scenery that we took in or even recall the actual driving we did for those 10 minutes to work, right? On our way to work. You're like, Whoa, what streets did I just take? I can't remember to making that left hand turn because you're, you're thinking your, your mind is somewhere else. But the, the mindfulness and that practice of, of mindfulness meditation and being in the moment in a race, what it does is it brings you back to the process. Mm-hmm. So even though it's kind of like you said, you know, when you described a race when you thought, okay, I'm three minutes and 10 seconds down to Craig Walton, oh, you know, good. I just, you know, it's like relief. But then you quickly got yourself back to, I need to start running fast. Mm. What can I do to start running fast? And so for me, it would be in the moment. Like if I'm having my swim, what kind of form am I swim? What kind of my stroke rate, my turnover, my high elbow, my catch? How can I do, focus on my actual technique that'll get me to move faster in the water? And as I approach transition and T1 and coming out of the water, what do I need to do and focus on getting myself up? running as fast as I can, you know, taking my goggles off, whatever it is to get through that transition and up there and not being like, oh, I'm in 30th place, thinking about results, thinking about like, where am I with in relation to the race? Because the swim doesn't affect the bike and the bike doesn't always affect the run that they're all, I mean, they're separate within their own little elements of the race in many ways, right? Because you could have a horrible swim, but get yourself back into it. So you can't give up on yourself. So if you're constantly in the moment of focusing, how can I pedal? faster and, and, and work on the pull up and the, and the upstroke as opposed to mashing down or whatever that is that I want to concentrate on in regards to my RPMs or whatever it is to get myself down the road instead of your mind wandering as, oh, this race is not going well. I'm not <laughs> fit today. My training didn't go well. I got a little bit of a niggle here. If you start doing that, you're not in the moment and therefore you're not actually affecting how your race is going. And so for me, I really focus on trying to be dialed in and focusing on the process. We talk a lot about process goals and, and the process of, of, of moving faster down the road in our run, our swim, in the water, or our bike, as opposed to outcome goals, right? Outcome goals are, I want to win this race. I want to be a world champion. Okay, that's great. You want to be a world champion. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, I got to get better sleep. Okay, those are some process goals. How are you going to get better sleep? Well, I got to go to bed at 930. Got to have some earplugs. Got to got a lot of kids. I've got to make, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, right? So you you break it down to outcome, your overall like end result goals. And then you're at, because those are easy. You can, we can all write down those. But then you start working out your plan four years out. Well, I want to be Olympic champion. Okay, well, it's 2005. How are you going to do that? Well, this year, I'm going to focus on my run because my run's not as good, right? So you start building in smaller blocks and smaller pieces, yearly pieces towards the four-year Olympic block, and then more actually daily kind of process goals and how you're going to get better today than you were yesterday. And then you look forward to tomorrow. And what are you going to do tomorrow to get better a week from now? So it's mm-hmm. kind of being more in the moment and focusing on the process and the journey that's going to get you to to, to those ultimate outcome goals. Cause I'll leave you with this. If you're not enjoying the process goals, if you don't enjoy what you do every day, the daily minutia, the daily stuff in general, those general process goals. And that's what I loved. I loved for me, I love just wanting to be better than I was yesterday, trying to self have self-improvement and be better uh, moving forward uh, in, in the years to come, constantly trying to be the best, And I always wanted to be the best when everyone else was at their best, right? And that was the Olympic Games. 
And it never happened for me. I didn't win a medal. I mean, does that mean I'm a fa failure in my career? I say no. I say I had a I had an amazing career. I mean, going to four Olympic games and being a world champion and 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 representing my country four four different times and winning the biggest prize races in the world. And when guys were trying to win those races, I had an amazing career. It's just that the Olympic Games, man, it is so hard to do that. I wish people can appreciate how hard it is to win when you have Simon Whitfield and Alistair Brownlee both who bookend my career, right? In our <laughs> career as well. They bookend both of our careers. I mean, you've got Simon Whitfield and Alistair Brownlee. They're, they're ultimate metal hogs, right? I mean, they've taken, <laughs> they've taken three gold medals and one silver of yeah. four Olympic games. I mean, yeah. it's, yeah. it's crazy. It's just not even, it's not even right. It's like the Michael Phelps of our era. Those guys, I mean, they, it's, it's hard. It's hard to break through when you have that kind of class at the top. You no, know? Well, I, I, th I think you, you, you you summarized just so I I just love that last five to ten minutes by the way because I think understanding the process did you I'm not sure if you've had a chance um, but if you listen to my conversation with Hamish Carter um, yes. and yeah, yeah, I, 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 I was really really blown away because you know I invite him on it's been several years since we've chatted and blah 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 yeah. and he he took me through that whole process of going from you know 2000 where he was a favorite um, yes. and he finished way back I think it was 26 or something to uh, to winning the gold and how he had to change as a person rather than an athlete. And, and we really got down to what do you mean by a person and an athlete? And he broke it down. And, and basically like you were just saying, it was all very much about being present and being in the process. And he said, what was interesting? And I got him to talk through the final mile as he ran against Bevan Dockett and I was trying to chase them down. And, you know, yes, and, and, yes. and, 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 and he, he just said, all I was thinking about was cadence, leg turnover, arm position. He said, by the time I got to the cross the finishing line, he goes, "What a great atmosphere! This would be a great race to win." He's wow! Like, oh, holy wow. crap! Holy crap! I won it. You know, it was that oh, kind of. Man. He was so insular. He was that so goosebumps. Yeah, wow. he was. So, That's awesome. And it was just like wow. He because for him, he he really talked about. You know, he felt like he deserved a medal, and that Simon Whitfield didn't deserve a medal in 2000, and that was him as a person. He said it was oh, the person that wow. deserves the medal is the person that wins the medal. I mean, yes. that's it. It's uh, we all turn up, and and 50 yep. guys on the start line, whoever wins gets to have that medal. Anyway, it was a really. If you want to listen, to, it was uh, yes, I do. I look, do. He's a good mate of both of ours, and, and yes, and so it is worth if you get a chance to listen to that. And I, I was kind of, but what you've just said in that last 10 minutes is a uh, you've really just surmised exactly what he just said about, you know, the mental strategies we can all do about just simply being present. Uh, Mark Allen's another guy that was quite interesting when we talked about, he just said, look, I just worked on quietening the mind. Um, and, and I love that phrase because it's like, there's a lot of noise out there, especially these days, not just in sport, but there's a lot of noise out there yes. in terms of whether the media are pumping out, we're talking about COVID or we're talking about whatever we're talking about. It's like, rah, and all this right. noise. And it's like, calm down. Let's, what can we do to turn off that negative noise and be more present? Okay. Well, what can we control? We can turn off the media. We we can turn off TV. We can, there's a whole number of things. We can start taking control of our sleep. We can, like you said, nutrition, take control the controllables. So, mate, that was yes. all fantastic. And I just wanted, before, you know, I've, I've taken so much of your time, I, where the American men are now, um, I know this is kind of a, we've kind of shifting away from your career a little bit and yes. just looking more. Yes. Where, what do you think can be done? Because I still think the US men are uh, underperforming in terms of the world stage. I think you've, you've, you were the guy pushing it for 15 years and leading the way. What have we got? What's happening? And, and how do you think uh, the US men can improve their sort of standard and placing in the, in the world? Yeah, that's a great question. It's kind of the ultimate question for us, you know. I mean, I feel like I always get to kind of get asked that question, you know. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, buddy. I'm no, sorry. no, 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 not not by you, not by you, but just no, and just in general, like yeah, high performance, yeah. right? Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. like, hey, Hunter, w w I mean, we got to get the men better. And I was like, you know, I mean, I, for me, I was always trying to do my best, you know, to lead the way. And I think, you know, USA Triathlon, just kind of a funny side note, is that. You know, and I was trying to qualify for 2016 for Rio to be a five-time Olympian. And I had turned 40 years old and I had, had four kids at the time. So my, my world was entirely <laughs> different, man. Like it made, it was like so different. And when I was trying to do it, I was like, you know, I told my wife, Al, I go, USA Triathlon, like they, they really don't want me to, the high performance team does not want me to make this gains because this does not look good upon them to have the 40 year old going back for his fifth Olympics as the team that we're ascending. Like I, I shouldn't, I should be kicked. I should have been kicked out a long time ago. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like I shouldn't even have been able to make probably London 
mm-hmm. and, and go on to 2012, you know, and, and race there. I think it's, it's, it's putting ourselves and putting ourselves in vulnerable situations. Our men have to get into situations where we go and race constantly around. And we're starting to do that where we race around the world and, and we get ourselves to where as we're uncomfortable and always racing the best and it might not look pretty. We're not racing the World Cup. We're racing the WTS series. We're racing the highest level series of racing. And we got to do that on a consistent basis. We just can't come in and come out. We got to attack it and go with that. But we've also got to find, we got to find the talent. We have to, we live in the in, in, a, in a great country of 330 million people in the United States of America. We've got to go out and find the talent. We've got to go out and find more. Gwen Jorgensen's on the men's side. I feel like I feel like they're out there, and I feel like our sport is an amazing sport. We've just got to get get athletes and get the pipeline and get them starting up early enough that they see triathlon as an avenue, as success and a sustainable uh, 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 business model and a, and a sustainable job for them to do that they can make a good living doing it. Right? I mean, they can't think to themselves, "This is going to be a grind," you know, or whatever. Like, we got to go and encourage the fact that. Hey, listen, triathlon is a sport. It's an amazing sport. And with mixed relay too, it's a whole different world that's coming in. I mean, I don't know if a lot of your listeners know, but in 2021, the mixed relay is a new event that's being added to the sport of triathlon. And it's going to be two women, two men on the team, and they're going to do a mini, mini triathlon, right? So it's going to be a 300 meter swim, a seven, eight K bike, and then a, a, a 1600 meter run. It's going to take the woman about 20 minutes to do They're going to tag the man and then he's going to go. And then he's going to tag the woman. She's going to go. And then the man back again. So it's girl, guy, girl, guy, go back and forth. And it's going to be an amazing dynamic event that I think the U S can really own that. So I think maybe in, in this 2021 games, we should take ownership of the mixed relay. We had the best women in the world. I feel like we do with Katie Zafaris and Kristen Kirsten Casper and Summer Rappaport, who's already on the Olympic team. And Taylor, Sp- to- and Taylor Spivey. She's- Taylor Spivey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To- yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah absolutely. absolutely. We, we have amazing women right, that represent, you know. Um, uh, and so w- what about our men? Where are they? But I think the Ben Canutes and, and, and the Matt McElroys and, and, and uh, um, our, you know, our kid from Boulder, you know, as well. Like, I mean, we have these guys that are, super, super talented. And I think that they could excel in this, in this mixed relay format and in the overall format. I mean, they're getting there, but I feel like we're always getting there. I feel like yeah. always when we talk about it, at least when I discuss it, it's always like, well, we're close. We're knocking on the door, but we've been knocking on the door since I was in Athens and, 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 in, and in Beijing, like it's, 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 we need more, but I feel like we've got to do a better job of going out and finding talent and, and letting, and then showcasing that and then and coaching that talent up because the rest of the world is not slowing down. I mean, uh, no, no. Alistair Brownlee is going back again. Johnny Brownlee is going to be stronger than ever. <laughs> well, Mary Amola, to, I mean, Christian I mean, Blumenfeld. Vincent yeah, Lewis, Blumenfeld. Man. Yes. These guys, yeah. uh, these guys. Richard are, Murray. I mean, it's going to be stuff to the next Seriously, level. Mate, I, I, I think, you know, we, we've discussed it before and, and it's one of the reasons I was actually interested in getting involved in the US High Performance Program because I think there's such an opportunity and, and you can see it. And I think... When I when I had Chris McCormack on the show and, and he's doing a phenomenal job with the Super League trial, oh, I yeah. said, if I was a high-performance manager of any country, the number one go-to guy I'd have right now is Chris McCormack and say, what do I do to get my entire team into every Super League race that you have Absolutely. over and over again? He said, Greg, that is what the French are doing. He said, I'm actually yes. having to try and turn them down. And if you look at what the French are now doing with, with, with the number of men, Connex, uh, Vincent Lewis, and then yes. on, the, on the female side, they, they have um, – Cassandra Bogrant just coming yes. up and, and a number of these young women that are just coming up and they're just outstanding. And what they're doing is they're just racing. They're racing often. And I, I, I laugh because my career was spent doing 10 to 15 races on the Southern Hemisphere summer, 10 to 15 races in the Northern Hemisphere summer. So as yep. much as my career was 26 years long, I actually had, can add a number of seasons to that because we raced. But even better than that, when we raced in the Australian summer, I went to a race on a Saturday called a Grand Prix series yes. or Formula One series, whatever they called it, and we would often race three times. There'd be 20-minute races with a 10-minute break, but uh-huh. I got to race three times against Brad Bevan, Greg Welsh, Miles Stewart, Chris McCormack. It didn't matter. And one race I'd beat them, one race they'd beat me, but either way, I got to play with the big boys over and over and over and over again. And you can train the house down. You can become the greatest trainer you want, but if you don't know how to race, you don't have a chance in hell. So no, number one, true. I think the they biggest gotta- issue with America is there's not enough racing. Uh, and that's difficult and it's expensive. Um, number two, and this is, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this. 
there, there's definitely a culture here where you must go to college compared to other, you know, and, and I, I'm not saying I'm against it, but I kind of feel like when the American men go to college for four years from that great age between 18 and 22 when we're developing into, you know, from these teenage pimple face kids to, to men and they're doing one sport. Yeah. Meanwhile, I mean, I went to university in Australia and everything, but I, I did I did triathlon from the age of fifteen, and I was racing triathlon all throughout. You know, we're we're looking at where Australians go. We can always go study later. We can, but the whole thing about the American culture is that you got to have your college experience. Now, I I don't know. I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Do you think that is something that affects the men? Are they a little behind? Are they four years behind once they come out? Yeah. I, I think that's a great question, and it's a great. Um, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. Yes, they are. They are four years behind. I mean, I think around the world, university is not thought about. People, I think, go after their dreams and their and their willingness to want to be a professional athlete quicker and sooner. And it's their number one. They're all in. They go all in, like you did, like like Matt Reed did, like Chris McCormack did. I mean, you go all in on. I mean, you, you guys move to Europe. You'll you'll go to move to France, Australians and Kiwis, and they'll go into France and they'll just with a suitcase and say, hey let's 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 just do this let's go let's figure it out and you've got to figure it out quick because you're racing every weekend and you're getting that experience and that experience builds upon one on each other it's a layering effect and then you, you quickly get to so therefore at 22 you can be a world champion you know you can be you know you can be a simon lessing right you can be a spencer smith and be a world champion from great britain be a world champion at an early young young age right yeah. i think you're right here in the united states it's about university it's about going to college it's about but we, we, I mean, it's it's a, it's a challenging environment. No one shows up at 18 years old and says, you know what, I'm all in on triathlon. I'll forget college. I'm going all in and, and racing this and see what happens. I mean, that mentality, I think it, it doesn't really happen as much here. I think we're preconditioned to think that the our, our pathway, we have to have a backup plan, mm. so to speak, right? We got to have that university, like that degree, that diploma means that therefore there's security in that. And therefore I'm going to be okay. If triathlon doesn't work out, I'm going to be okay. Whereas it's almost like, Maybe mm. we should just start thinking about triathlon as like that is that is the backup plan. Like that's I mean, all you've got. It's like Vincent. That's all Lewis, you've got. Another it's all you've another got. one. And I hate to talk about uh, shows that I've had, but uh, Vincent Lewis, who I hadn't met before, well, I think we'd met briefly, but I had him on, and he basically his story was phenomenal. Where he basically said, "Look, I I watched my 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 dad leave at three in the morning every day to go work at the factory." and come back you know after lunch you know early afternoon and um that was what he did and and, uh, he worked incredibly hard for myself and my sister and and he said but you know i found sort of triathlon i can't remember the full story i have to listen to the the episode yeah Yeah, yeah, but basically he said to his dad look the money that you've saved up for me to go to college you know is there any chance i could have that and put it towards triathlon and his his, his dad said okay you know i'll support you for a year or whatever and he and and then vincent lewis went off and he won world junior championships and and triathlon and and vincent said to me and you know when i asked him when did you decide to go all in and he said well for me it was if i don't go all in there's nothing other than working in the factory or perhaps a local bike shop for the rest of my life that is my options yeah there was no university there was and he said i had to make it work yeah, I, and, and that desperation. Oh man, that gives me goosebumps. I love that. It is. And, and look, it is for every story we hear of somebody doing incredibly sex, you know, being successful. I'm sure there's a lot that <laughs> that don't make it. But right. I, I do think there is that that empowerment when your back is against the wall and you can only go step forward. I think that's a. I think you've touched on something there that is very true. That the. I'm not saying we shouldn't go get degrees, be academically no. educated no. by any means. No. I'm no. just saying, do we? do that while like for me personally I, I was studying about you know 15 20 hours a week i was doing triathlon 15 hours 20 hours a week and i was working at a restaurant chain called sizzler as a waiter yes. for 10 to 15 hours a week and that's what i did through those years i still had somewhat of a college experience but it wasn't about the college it was about becoming i'd already found my passion i wanted to be right. a professional triathlon i right. wanted to do something great in sport and i think if you know that and I've said this to my my niece, who you know, Kemper Reback, yep. who's yes. named after you, by the way. Yes. So this is, uh, and I, I told her just just before getting on that I was chatting to you. But um, <laughs> you know, I my said I, I said to Kemper, you know, what do you want? And, and I've known her since she was like six or seven. She's yes. wanted to be a professional triathlete. She loves the sport, and yeah. uh, and I'm like, well, you want to go to college for running, or do you want to be a triathlete? So it's this conversation of going, what is it going to take to become? you know, a, a great triathlete. Um, yeah. but I, 
It's, it's one of the conversations you and I could talk about for hours. And that's the reason why I think I should become the high performance manager. You're going to run the whole youth program under 23 yes. and boom. We've got it all figured out. We've got, <laughs> we got it all figured we, out. We got all the answers. <laughs> yes. I told, I told my wife uh, when a year ago when she came to me, she's like, when I was going through this difficult time and, and uh, transitioning to life after sport, you know, she's like, Hey, what did, what, what was your backup plan? Like in college, like when you were in school, Wake Forest, what was your backup plan? Like, you know, getting your degree, what were you going to be? And I told her, I said, Hey babe, you know, I was all in and being a professional triathlete. The reason why I went to Wake Forest was to become a better runner over four years that I could come out and be mm -hmm. a better overall triathlete. So mm -hmm. I was all in on I triathlon from the get go. I never had a backup plan. I love that. And she's like, I mean, and, and it, for me, it worked because I mean, I, I, when I was 15 years old, I want to be a professional triathlete. And I went to college as the vehicle. It was a means, it was, again, it was a means to an end to be better in what I was ultimately going to do. And I think if athletes do that, mm -hmm. that's different. But yeah, I, I mean, we can't, we can't, uh, I think sometimes fall back on, uh, and, and, and just weasel our way out of kind of go all in on something. Cause if you want something bad enough, you'll, you'll do a lot of things and, 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 and go, go after it enough to, to really go after and get it. And that's inspiring. And, 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 and you, but you got to have support around you to foster that kind of uh, environment, right? You mm -hmm. got to have great parents. You got to have people or, or family members. If it's not your parents, family members, people that believe in you. And I think it's so important for kids to hear this and even adults to hear that. Surround yourself and be around people that believe in you, that are your champions. As Chris McCormack said, that they're all, that all love you and that are all your friends. Because why else would you be around people that are downers, that don't think you can make it, that are, that are killers of your dreams? When you tell them your dreams that I want to be an Olympic champion, that they say, you can't do that. That. Well, that's what they can't do because they were too scared to go and do it. Mm. You know, you and I, we decided to say, yes, we're going to jump in. We're going to jump into this, 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 this body of water and go for it literally and figuratively to say, listen, we're all in on triathlon and we want to be the best we possibly can be. And I think it's gotten to where us to where, to where we've been and, 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 and amazing places around the world. And, uh, and, and it's something that, you know, it's a career that the difficulty now for me is trying to match that, trying to match my enthusiasm and my excitement and love of triathlon to whatever's next in life. I've got it with my family and with my kids. It's natural. It's Nate, that natural love, but where is it and other things and, and actually business and, and stuff like that. So it's coming, but it's just going to take some time. And, um, and, you know, Greg, I'm, I'm so, it's so cool to hear you, uh, on this and, and, and hosting your own podcast and how well it's doing. It's so fun to see you just killing it and interviewing the best, uh, champions in, in sport and even outside of sport. I mean, it's really cool to see that you're kind of honing in on your passion and, and, uh, it's, it's, it's really neat. So congratulations with all your success. It's really been fun to watch and listen to. Oh, thanks buddy. And I think this is a fantastic place to wrap up, but that, that last few minutes was just absolutely wonderful. Um, Hunter, I, I think, you know, when I listen to you and, your passion for sport and high performance uh, and, and the youth. I just think, you know, the, the, there's positions there open for you, but I almost feel like you 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 can start something on your own, <laughs> a high performance yeah. academy, the, the Kemper, you know, the Hunter Kemper Academy for high performance for youth or something like that. And I think if you just start something like that, it's like I said with that Chris Rock uh, uh, quote earlier, it's like you just start pushing your car. I think you'll be amazed how many people will want to jump on board with you because I think that not only is your passion, I think that's where your talent and strengths are. And I think you've just got to almost lay it out, pull the trigger and just see what happens because I think um, – there's a lot of people that, that love you a lot and think you're an amazing guy, I being one of them. So if you start like something like that, you know you'll have my support. So I, uh, I think you. when, when you, you start identifying, you know, and I think through this podcast, you've been able to feel the energy of the way you describe the sport and the youth and, and high performance. Yeah. That, you know, you start to go, hang on, this is what I really enjoy talking about. So I think yep. that's kind of how I was with this podcast. It was simply I really enjoyed chatting to, you know, my mates and they're all high performers and I started just hitting the record button. Um, but anyway, mate, this has been, is there anything else that we need to chat about? I think we've covered a lot. I think this was a fantastic conversation. Um, yeah, yeah, just, no, uh, I mean, I it, it's, it's, it's hit it all with me. I mean, I, I, um, I've enjoyed you asking me to come on and be a part of this, you know, I, mean, I, I consider, I consider you a, a really good friend and it's fun to kind of hear, uh, I really wanted to kind of get you to open up about 2007 and what you're most proud of in fourth place, you know, and, and finishing in Athens and your career, uh, you should, you should invite me. We should do it next time we do this. We should do it with me as a guest host and I'll come back and I'll interview you for, uh, <laughs> for an hour and, and we'll, uh, we'll dive into all of your, your amazing highlights and your amazing career because 
you know, you, you were, you were so talented at what you did, you know, you always just, it, it amazed me how well you could ride your bike and then how well you could run off of riding the bike that fast. I was just <laughs> blown away by your natural ability and your, your willingness to want to win at the highest level. And you, and you did just that. And so I would love, to, I would love to interview you more and talk to you more about, uh, you know, Athens and, 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 and you and Laura, and you're married to someone that's reached the highest level in her sport and then is amazing, amazing, uh, athlete herself. So well, now let's you've got do two, it, mate. Let's two, two beautiful kids. Yeah, have, well, that's, that's sure. now the focus. Well, the next time we do this, mate, we'll be on a couch sipping a few beers. I, I want to really take this show. So it's in person. And, uh, but for now oh, with, with, awesome. with, the crazy, with the craziness of the world, this is, this is what we get. Yes. But, um, yes. I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you everybody for listening. This was just absolutely inspiring, incredibly entertaining as always. Thanks so much, Hunter Kemper. Awesome, Thank buddy. you. All Thanks, right. Bud. Cheers. Thanks a lot for listening to Be With Champions. If you enjoyed the show, your support would truly be appreciated. You can visit the Be With Champions Patreon page or you can subscribe with your podcast app of choice. Don't miss the next episode, so subscribe and be notified. For show notes, if you want to know more, please visit bennettendurance.com. I'm Phil Liggett, and on behalf of Greg Bennett, here's to the next time, and I hope you will join Greg again very soon.